Hi, everyone. Welcome to our weekly painting webinar. And we are so excited uh, that you guys are here. Today is, I just have to think about it uh, every time. Today is Friday, December um, 11th. Um, so I just, uh, just incredible how time flies. And we have uh, new people. So I'm really, really excited. Um, thank you, Alina, so much for joining us. I hope I can just provide as much um, information that you can use as possible. Uh, welcome to this community. And um, I'm just going to give a little bit of a pre view <laughs> or, or, or introduction, I guess. Um, of how this is gonna work. Uh, two hours we'll be painting, 10 minutes after the two hours, we'll take a break, we'll resume uh, after that break. And then for the rest of the time until the third hour, we'll just do critique and feedback and I'll explain how to do it. So Jen is not here with us today. Uh, she uh, is currently shooting uh, the, TV series. And, and I think without her permission, I'm going to share the video that she sent, but later during the break. Um, this session is being recorded. So if you're watching from the future, thanks, from, thanks for uh, joining us. Um, if you haven't had a chance to do so, please watch the video uh, inspiration for this series. We're very excited. And I'm going to dive in right, uh, right ahead. If you have any questions, please use the chat. Um, I will be checking the chat. Um, so if any questions arise, uh, please uh, let me know. I'm going to do this uh, solo today. So I'll just uh, in, uh, switch back and forth from um, the sketching and the painting and then talking about things related to mushrooms. And I just wanted to say thank you to Chloe. She is in the UK and she is co-hosting the webinar um, with us. So uh, thanks, Chloe, for being there. And uh, she has uh, some juicy bits of information um, regarding mushrooms that she sent uh, this morning. So I just can't wait to share. And uh, I think let's just uh, get started. Um, very important before you guys um, start, uh, I just sent an email and I said that if you're uh, if you're working from live, meaning that if you have an actual uh, mushroom <laughs> in front of you, then uh, this does not apply. If you don't have an image reference, um, please go to the folder, the image folder that we put together and pick one by putting your comments uh, next to the image. Um, yeah, so we try um, every, every week we try to make sure that everyone has a different image because at the end of the day we want this um, series and collection of paintings to reflect uh, the diversity of our community. So um, let me just uh, get back to uh, the folder and I am just um, going to, well, let me just do it from another uh, place. Uh, I'll do it this uh, really quick uh, share photo album and uh, you don't need to log in or anything uh, you just like dump it uh, in the folder and I am going to uh, let me see if I can just okay yeah I am going to oops sorry dump the link on the chat so uh, this is a chat of the, I mean, this is a folder of the images. Please just make sure that the image that you select, if it's from the folder, it, um, no one else has taken it. Um, so we try to keep things as diverse as possible. If you have your own image, then perfect. I would recommend going to the folder and find out if um, we put an image that is exactly the same and someone else um, has taken that image. But um, if you're working from live, then uh, no problem. This is gonna be really special. Um, so this is the image that I selected um, from the folder and I'll explain why, um, but essentially I was able to uh, go to a Kinko's um, and then print out uh, a color uh, version just because 
uh, it facilitates um, the, the translation of the image onto the um, surface. Um, and I also do it so uh, it has more of a visual reference when you, um, when you look at what I'm doing. Uh, I'm going to talk about my format. Um, I'm using uh, 12 by 16. It's very large for the time that we're going to be working together. I recommend smaller um, unless you want to dedicate more time to this painting, which I also recommend. Uh, so uh, 12 by 16, uh, if you have uh, 8 uh, by 12, that's ideal, and smaller also can work. Um, I'm using um, landscape orientation and a rectangular shape format. And this is going to be very important because I'm going to talk about composition. Um, different than the format is the painting surface. And uh, my painting surface is cotton paper. It's a special kind of like paper that's made out of like um, cotton. It's not woven, but um, it has um, a, a, a very good uh, absor absorption uh, level, so it works really well for oils. Depending on your support or I would say your painting surface, things may look or feel different. Uh, if you have canvas uh, board, that's a little bit more challenging because of the micro or the, yeah, the micro pockets. Um, anything that's on wood, uh, I recommend being uh, gessoed or sealed at least. Uh, if you use regular paper paper and you use oil, it's just going to be a, a disaster. <laughs> I'm just going to say it right now. So don't use um, oil with regular paper. It's just going to give you a lot of problems. Uh, and if you use a different material, um, so let me see. Um, yeah, let me just go right uh, to the folder. And I just got a message from... Uh, Sarah Jennings, and uh, she selected one of the image. So hold on one second. Uh, here we go. I'm just going to put her name here. Mm -hmm. Okay, and just going back. And I was just, uh, if you use a different medium, uh, acrylic, uh, watercolor, uh, dry, even dry medium, if you just uh, intend to sketch, then, um, yeah, uh, I think the selection of your support should be different. I highly, we highly encourage you to use oil paint. Uh, we believe, unless there is a specific reason or you've been painting with us for a very long time, uh, believe it or not, it's better to use oil if you are a beginner painter than to use acrylic. I'm not gonna go into the reasons why right now, but we highly, highly encourage you to encourage you to use oil paint if you have it. You'll be much more pleased with the results regardless of the experience with it or the whatever level, whatever that means. Um, uh, we see time and time again with acrylic, the results are not as elevated uh, unless you know how to use acrylic properly. So acrylic is more difficult than oil. Um, that's the bottom line for us. And we have uh, a bit of experience with um, sessions and uh, teaching. Oh my gosh, what am I talking about? All right, so let me just uh, go right ahead. And uh, yeah, perfect. Uh, thank you. And Chloe, if you see someone that is uh, coming in, just uh, let them in, because right now I'm just going to focus on the, on the painting. And if you have a, a little bit of time, if you want to dump the image of the book that you just shared with me, because I think it's just spectacular, if you can put it on the Google folder. And there were two references. Let me just, I'm, I'm taking time from you guys, but I'll extend it a little bit. There were three references that I found. First of all, last night, I think it was like past midnight, I was um, shopping for mushroom sweaters. But I, I just thought, you know, I wanted a mushroom sweater. So um, I found one <laughs> to, for $600. So, so I said, okay, that's not going to happen. Uh, then this morning I was just checking uh, artists using uh, mushrooms either as subjects or as medium. And in fact, um, I found two. One is an artist who actually makes uh, furniture using mushrooms. And um, I Google mushroom furniture just because I thought, you know, I would just put some images in the portfolio of um, uh, stools or tables. And what came up was this artist who actually uses 
a specific kind of mushroom to, cre to create the actual material to build furniture. So the chairs and the stools look almost like they're rotting, but uh, the material is stronger than concrete, apparently. Very interesting. So Chloe, if you can find that, um, yeah, if you can add it and let me know on the, I know, right, Claire? Let me know on the chat if you can, uh, if you dumped it. And the second one is that, uh, a, a, I hate to say this word, a fiver artist. Uh, I really don't like to use that word because ultimately we're all artists and we use different mediums, but uh, an artist who um, uses fiver knitting as medium and what uh, they do, uh, they create mock-ups of mushrooms and then they go to the forest and they put the mock-ups, needed mock-ups of mushrooms in the forest and then they take a picture and then they just leave it there uh, for the mushroom uh, pickers, whatever that's called. So if you can find those two, that'll be awesome because they're really inspiring and they just made me very excited and uh, all right, so first thing that I'm gonna do on my sketch, I'm just gonna set up the parameters. And since I have uh, the image right here, let me just uh, bring this down a little bit. Uh, since I have the image right next to me, then I can just decide how tall and how low this is gonna be. Composition is something that we constantly overlook. We make images or we recreate things inside of the format that um, disregard the actual shape and the size. And sometimes we made things that are too small and we have too much negative space or things that are really close to the edge and they look off frame. So be very careful in regards of how you want to arrange things on your uh, format. That's number one most important thing right now. It's not likeness. It's not um, if the mushrooms look like mushrooms or not, that has nothing to do with this very important step. And in order to do that, what I do is I make sure that I set up clear paths um, and clear sort of like a, a stop. So I know that the mushroom needs to be within those two lines rather than just picking one image uh, or one point, which I don't know exactly where is it gonna fall. I just uh, set up an entire um, height. So same thing, I'm gonna do the same thing right here. And then I'll do the same thing right here. You'll be amazed at the end of this session, how many of us will end up with a composition that's gonna be so close to the edge that's gonna, or with so much like negative space, that's gonna either look off camera or it's gonna look like uh, uh, we didn't control the arrangement. It happens every single time and I always say it's better to be familiar with, with uh, the orthodox rules and then break them than just uh, forego the, the, uh, the rules or tradition and then end up something that we have to, um, uh, we have to reason why we did it. So again, give yourself enough visual space. Um, I always say that the edges of the, and by the way, Alina, the, uh, uh, this presentation is going to be uh, webinar style. So the only way to interact is uh, uh, via chat uh, because we record it and then um, we put it on the website. So if you have any questions, uh, add them in the chat and I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, but anyhow, yeah. So I always say that the edges of a format, the edges of a format, they act as magnets. And even though we may think that we have enough space between whatever we paint and uh, the edge, uh, if we put it too close, that's gonna look like it's cropped. Um, for the purposes of perception, uh, anything that's really close to the edge, um, yeah, it just looks like it's forced uh, or pulled. And then it just um, discombobulates the entire composition. Uh, and that's not even going into territory that perhaps that painting is gonna be shown or you wanna frame it. And then the frame always eats up a little bit of the um, support and it, it just looks really odd and not very well planned. Give yourselves enough space. Um, all right, so now that I have this, I'm just gonna go to the first stage, which I call potato shapes. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is uh, create a, sort of like a, a, a quick silhouette of the shape. Um, I flicker my eyes back and forth 
And what I do is I just, um, in a very quick way, I do a quick silhouette. So I'm not intending to be uh, accurate, perfect, or anything like that. The reason why I do this is because I want to find out what uh, uh, a draft or a sketch of this looks like uh, in my format. Um, composition, it's not just how you arrange things between themselves. Um, composition is also how things are um, arranged in relationship to the format. So um, yeah, so once I have this draft, I can go back to the draft, to the potato shape. It doesn't have to make sense. It doesn't have to be recognizable. I'm using charcoal because it's the most flexible um, sketching uh, material there is. Uh, I can just wipe it off and then redo it again. Um, so that's the reason why it's so good. And then I just do it one more time. Repetition and simplification. Um, thanks, Chloe. So actually, I'm just going to take a quick pause. Uh, yeah, let me just, uh, while you do the sketch, uh, I'm just going to share uh, the things that we were talking about. Uh, hold on one sec, because it's really fun. Um, it's really fun. Hold on one second. I'm just refreshing the folder. Oh my gosh. <laughs> All right, so this is, I'm going to start with the book. Um, ooh, um, so this is the book that uh, Chloe just uh, shared with me um, this morning. It's a book about mushrooms. I think it's a new, uh, is it a recent publication? I'm not sure, uh, Chloe, if you want to say something. But uh, my first thought, uh, I hope that they, I mean, I hope they sell the book like that because I would just buy it to have it. But I just think that's possibly just, uh, do they sell the book like that? What do you think? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a new book, newly published, and they, it, it doesn't look like that in the shops. It hasn't unfortunately got mushrooms hanging out of it. Oh, well, this image got me. I just thought it was just brilliant. It's great, hey? Yeah, yeah, thanks for sharing. But yeah, the book uh, just talks about mushrooms, science about mushrooms, that it's really interesting. And um, uh, yeah, I just, um, I'm gonna add it to the queue or to the, yeah, to the list of books. This is the mushroom-based uh, furniture, you guys. Um, it, it looks horrible, but it's at the same time, it's so wonderful. So this is the material, I think he's based in San Francisco. And he, he didn't discover, but he found out that this um, uh, mushroom uh, is very hard. <laughs> so he makes furniture out of it. I just think it's brilliant. Uh, and then he seals the uh, furniture with uh, beeswax, I believe. So it doesn't uh, degrade or grow. So this is the way it looks and it stays this way. But it's, um, I don't know, I think it's alive. Um, I love the fact that he's an artist, um, and I think this is, this is the guy probably, right, uh, Chloe? Um, yeah, that's him. I just think it's amazing. And he, I just saw images in a gallery of a structure that he made, almost like a bridge. Um, but yeah, it seems like it, it's pretty light material. Um, and is this the... Oh, this is the installation of the kneaded mushrooms, correct? Yeah, they're, they're really discreet. Then I, I was, I imagine that they'd be big and um, mm -hmm. like toy-like, but they're really discreet and natural looking. <laughs> I just think also this is brilliant. <laughs> oh, it's amazing. Oh, yeah. I, I, and I think she leaves them like that. So I just, can you imagine like going to pick mushrooms and then finding a needed, a needed mushroom <laughs> just blow my mind. Um, anyhow, um, thanks so much for sharing this. And I think it's important for, uh, my mind was already like thinking on other stuff, obviously, but I just love the fact that artists are using mushrooms, not just the way we do as a, as a image um, reference, but also as um, as a medium, um, I think it's just amazing. So I'm going back to the sketch. Um, 
I realize now that I want to make some changes. So what I'm going to do is, since I have a, a, an, an initial potato shape, so what I do now is I make adjustments. It's easy to make adjustments when you are on this stage than later when, we, when you've done a lot of like details of work. So um, last week, you guys, we did crows and it was so good and it was so challenging because the slightest variations on the silhouette of a crow uh, turned the crow into either a pigeon or a chicken. So it was very unforgiving. We had to be very specific about the anatomy of uh, the crow. Otherwise, uh, it, it was a different species of bird. I'm excited about the mushrooms because I feel I am anticipating, and I already see it, that the mushrooms are not as unforgiving as uh, the birds. So there is something about this that um, it makes me really happy uh, because we can concentrate uh, more on uh, texture and stuff like that. So notice that what I'm doing is I'm repeating, retracing, but also changing. Uh, one of the, the biggest habits that causes so many problems is uh, that we set up some lines at the very beginning and we don't adjust them. We just stick with them. And then all of a sudden, since we spend like uh, an hour and a half looking, we realize that uh, there are things on that um, sketch that uh, they, they look off. So naturally, um, I mean, after looking at the same uh, subject for a long time, we realize that there are certain relationships that are not, like for example, at the bottom, it's a little bit higher on mine. So this is the time right now to make those changes. And that's why using charcoal, using simplification, uh, studying from what I call a potato shape and uh, basing uh, our process uh, um, on repetition, it's really helpful. So later, we'll still have to move things around later. The drawing doesn't stop. But um, for now, I'm just gonna do the area inside. Yeah. So I have, we have photographs. Um, if you're using a photograph, we have photographs and um, that we use as a reference. Very important, you guys. The photograph is the starting point. This painting is not meant to be seen uh, right next to the photograph. So someone can say um, how close we got to the photograph or not. Uh, a lot of artists use photographs as uh, inspiration. Uh, but the painting is meant to be seen by itself. Uh, we use the photograph as a reference, as a reference, as a departure point. Um, I'm hoping that our paintings look completely different than the photograph because that's the bottom line or um, the bottom line, I would say, um, the reason why we're creating. So we uh, translate through our own experience and our own uh, level of observation. Uh, this is not meant to uh, be a photographic um, uh, assignment uh, in which if we don't capture the exact same proportions, we fail. So uh, not at all. So I'm gonna do, um, I'm gonna start with what I call the structural lines. So once I get the silhouette, I started making already tons of adjustments, but I wanna make sure that I do as many adjustments as I can with a shape, um, that is very preliminary. I don't wanna to commit to details right now. I do not want to commit to details. I know that I will see things differently in five minutes, 10 minutes, and an hour and a half later. So uh, structural lines, once I have the silhouette, are lines that are um, uh, fragmenting, uh, deconstructing uh, the main silhouette into smaller shapes. The idea is that I have 100% of the uh, painting surface when I do the potato shape, I reduce the percentage of drawing area to a much smaller uh, area. And then when I do the structural lines, I even reduce the drawing uh, areas into different ones, but much smaller. So in a way, going from broader to um, more specific, it facilitates the addition of details. We do it the other way around. We start with details because we wanna make sure that our sketch looks like a mushroom. And then we forget about composition, we forget about um, structural uh, elements. Uh, and then uh, an hour into the process, we realize that you know, this is not looking good and we wanna start from scratch. Um, 
I'm sorry to say this because most of us have gone through this, but if you feel uh, in the middle of the session, <laughs> this is gonna sound uh, painful. If you feel like you wanna start from scratch, uh, it just means that you may be rushed through certain elements and overlooked certain things because uh, there are opportunities to make changes uh, the earlier we are in this in, in the pro in the process. So that's why I do not rush and I just set realistic expectations. Nothing needs to be recognizable. So uh, at this stage. So what I'm going to do right now, actually, I'm just going to do the hood, the hood. Uh, and Chloe, if you're still there, if you can ask, uh, if I can ask you, what are the parts of the mushroom? Because I have no idea. I just call it hood and stem, but who knows um, what they actually uh, are called. <laughs> so um, yeah, thanks. And then I'm just gonna do the other one. And the reason is because I want continuity between both sides of that uh, umbrella or hood or whatever that's called. And uh, that's the reason why I do it first. And then I can just like um, open that up and then do the stem. Uh, flicker your eyes back and forth. Uh, don't worry about uh, this looking uh, this or that amateurish or infantile or all those uh, um, horrible words that uh, we we call or we label our process. This is just the beginning and it's not supposed to be judged at this stage. It's too early. It's too early. And by the way, no one's supposed to see what we're doing right now. So uh, we don't have to justify everything, every single thing that we that we do. Just uh, try to enjoy the process um, and try to enjoy the process. Just concentrate on observation. Um, let's just put it this way. Okay, the mushroom anatomy. Working down from the lid, which is called the cap, the cap has then got scales and then the hangy downy bits around the edge are called tubes and then on the underside of the cap, there's gills and spores. Okay. And then it has um, a stipe or a stalk uh, with a ring around it. And then the bottom of it, where it connects to the earth or connects to whatever it's growing on, is called a vulva, V-O-L-V-A. What? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, <laughs> I've added the uh, ana anatomy diagram to the, to the folder. Okay, so. let me just go right now. It's, that is just super fascinating. It's um, pretty biological, obviously. Right? Yeah, gills. Oh, I see it right on top. Oops, a uh, cap. Okay, one second. Um, scale. What's the difference between the cap and the scale? You think? Um, I think I don't know. The scales are the bits that come off. The bits. Okay. Okay. Cap, ring, stipe or stalk. Wow. Yeah. Vulva. Jeez. <laughs> and then, and then beneath the vulva, uh, there's mycelial threads, which okay. are the connective tissue that. Obviously, oh, I have some, yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, thank you that, oh, you guys, yes. Thank you so much. Check this out from the same artist. These are the needed mushrooms. Thanks, Chloe. No worries. This is just brilliant. Ah, <laughs> oh, come on. You know, we always associate this knitting art or fiber art with, uh, uh, uh people wrapping things on uh, tree trunks this is just uh, takes it to the next level i don't i don't know when she did this or they did this um sorry and um but it just looks uh, uh really incredible and super smart all right so thank you so much yeah uh so cap and stock and gills and yeah the vulva, vulva. Wow, that's uh, incredible. All right, so I'm just continuing 
my sketch and um, just doing uh, this bit right here. And depending on how, which image you chose, I chose this one for many reasons. Uh, I love the um, uh, tonal um, effect. So everything's uh, uh, based on neutrals. I like the fact that it's high key. I was inspired by that um, artist from Finland who did this, that amazing uh, high key painting of the mushrooms. I also love the fact that there's no background in this case. The mushrooms are on a surface or a table. So it reminds me of Beatrix uh, study of mushrooms, which I'm obsessed with her. Uh, I'm obsessed with her portrait. Um, I just, I have to share this image because I just think it's really beautiful. I'm obsessed with uh, this uh, photograph uh, of Beatrix Porter, right? Beatrix Porter, uh, yeah, Potter, Beatrix Potter. Um, everything about this uh, is just so beautiful. Uh, and she's the one who uh, did this study. So I was inspired by that. And that's the reason why I chose this, uh, this image as well. No background. And again, uh, I encourage you to uh, take a look and watch um, the introduction because they talk about the differences between all the paintings that we put together in the portfolio. Um, but my point about this little dissertation is that check um, what view do you have of the relationship between the cap and the stalk of your mushroom? Because uh, another reason why I chose this is because I can see the gills. Thanks, Chloe. I can see the gills of, I love using that word for a mushroom. Uh, in one of the mushrooms and then the other one a uh, little bit also. So the absence of color for me um, gets um, substituted by the interesting point of view of this uh, still life. So that's the reason why I chose it. And I'm just gonna go to uh, the other mushroom right now and structure a line, the line that splits or divides uh, structural lines uh, are lines that are usually uninterrupted and they just break up um, a shape. Um, they just break up a shape. So what I'm looking for structural lines are exactly that, lines that are um, breaking up the shape into smaller areas. Um, another thing that I would recommend is uh, when we sketch or paint, we tend to make very regular lines. Um, what does it mean, very regular lines? So if there is an arch, we make a perfect arch, very regular. Uh, if there, there's a dome, we just make it like very regular. So it looks almost uh, artificial. So with mushrooms, I highly encourage you to find the slight variations in whatever curvature that you may have. Because the last thing I would want on the mushroom is that it looks stiff or rigid. Um, I think if there's anything beautiful, beautiful about the shape of a mushroom, it's the, the fact that they're very organic looking. Um, you can almost um, sense the growth, uh, the natural growth. So if we make things that are too straight or too parallel, or they don't have, I would even exaggerate you guys because uh, I haven't seen any of the mushrooms uh, or the photos that I, that I picked. Yes, there is a structure. And um, I almost uh, look at this in, in architectural terms. Uh, and I look at anything botanical in architectural terms because I feel like I want to find out how it's built or constructed in order to understand how to draw it. It's the same thing with figures and portraits. It's very important to know the anatomy so we know what components um, and what kind of relationship things have to have. Um, so yeah, I would definitely exaggerate if you have something that feels very parallel because nothing would make your mushroom looks more, our mushrooms more rigid looking than having regular lines. All right. so. I think that's good. And yeah, I think that's good. Again, the best part of this is that it's very forgiving to draw. I'm going to shave this off. So notice that what I'm doing as I add elements, I'm able to visualize more differences. So this is what 
naturally happens. We have the tendency of doing something and then five minutes after we look back at, at it and we say, oh my gosh, it's atrocious. And what do we do? We start blaming ourselves. Um, I think that's like, it's not really how uh, things happen. Um, as we add, we'll be able to uh, establish more relationships between things. So, all right. And then I have the dirt, which I love um, this part. I also love the fact and this composition, and that's why I didn't intentionally wanna, uh, wanted to do a vertical um, orientation on my format. Um, the fact that they're on a table and the point of view is horizontal forces my brain to work by observation and not by association. So it, I find myself at, at an advantage by, oh my gosh, I need to check this. Um, I'm gonna uh, check Chloe, sorry, I interrupted. Oh, Dina, yeah, thanks for, uh, I just uh, click on your, um, on your, uh, oh my gosh, are these like live mushrooms inside of the pendants? Oh, no way. Oh, yo, yo. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, I'm just going to share this later. But Dina just uh, sent um, this amazing. And if you want, Chloe, if you want to grab one of those photos and put it on the uh, folder um, on the Google um, um, yeah, link, uh, Dina just shared um, uh, uh, like, oh, clay sculpture. Well, we'll find out. Yeah. Uh, mini terrariums. Uh, as pendants, they're, 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 they have to be live. I hope they're live. Um, they're alive, I'm, I'm sorry. But they're little tiny glass domes and they're mushrooms inside. I mean, it just can't, it just can't. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm so happy um, we're doing this uh, for many reasons, but uh, as in everything um, that we choose as a subject, we end up learning a lot of a lot of things and discovering a lot of things. So I'm just gonna move, oh, I need to move fast because um, I wanna start uh, staining at least before the first hour. And by all means, if you are already there, um, yeah, just, just go for it. And I'll explain, uh, Alina, I'll explain uh, exactly what it is. But by the way, uh, the two hours doesn't mean like uh, the finished product needs to look spectacular. We always end up um, with something that I consider work in progress. Um, and I love that you guys follow a different um, a pace, a different pace. Uh, some people during the two hours, they're only sketch and do the staining and that's it. And that's perfect. Uh, it just depends on how much time you wanna allocate to uh, the subject. I will tell you this, um, at the end of the two hours, the work that we do is amazing, but it's deserving of a little bit more time because things start to get really interesting uh, in the last few minutes of the process. But I will also tell you this, uh, there is nothing harder than stopping work and then uh, trying to get back to it a day later or two days later or a week later. So uh, this will test your level of commitment to the painting. Um, I highly encourage you to continue or add more time. That's the reason why we do the studio time sessions on Wednesdays, because it's an opportunity to really force us to uh, work on our pieces. Uh, there's nothing much harder than revisiting a painting that we started. And that's a test. It's a test of how committed uh, we are to painting. All right, the next step and the final step in the sketching process, and I'm sorry I'm taking so much time, is the um, shading. Uh, so what I want to do with shading, it's, I want to fade these lines that I have. Uh, so it creates the illusion of form and the illusion of light direction. Anything that feels linear, it's just going to feel very uh, prim premature, I guess, or not uh, elevated enough. So uh, we are, in fact, being unrealistic, pretending that just the lines will make it look really good because it's it's not really what happens. We need to fade those lines into... Um, um, shades of charcoal. The, the, the most traditional approach to shading uh, is or deconstructing the shades and highlights on the mushroom from darker to lighter. 
So identify where the darker areas are. So mine is right here. So this is going to be. Um, and then there's a little bit of a, and look what happens with uh, when I shade something against an edge. The line stops being a line and becomes an edge. So that's the reason why shading is, uh, it makes the drawing um, so much more elevated because uh, we're fading. There's a little bit of darkness right here. Ooh, I can't wait for the lights and shadows on the cap of the mushrooms. There's a little bit of light underneath. So I need to understand the light direction in the room or the space. And um, the more pressure I put on the surface, uh, the more charcoal I'm gonna leave. The less pressure, uh, the less charcoal. And um, yeah, so that's what I would suggest. So darker to lighter, work by value, uh, not by location. By value means uh, try to um, uh, create the scale of values uh, by um, looking at where they are, rather than just doing all the shading in the cap and then moving to all the shading in the um, stock. Um, if you do that, things will look very flat because um, they will not uh, have a relationship between uh, the light and the whole scene. So that's the reason why it's better to shade by value. Uh, and the idea is that uh, when we start adding those um, shaded areas, the line's going to start to disappear, and that's what we want. And uh, what it makes is that um, once the line fades, then we're able to go back and realize that perhaps there are certain things that we need to adjust. And in fact, this is the stage in which I realize I need to still work on the drawing because when I do the um, when I do the shading, um, then I have a new opportunity to to resketch to draw. So. Painting is drawing. Painting is drawing. I forgot who said that. Um, Chloe, if you want to find out. I mean, I just don't even know if someone said that, but I think someone did. Painting is drawing. It means that the most important part of the process is drawing. The drawing doesn't stop when we just switch to paint brushes. The drawing is everything, whether we use charcoal, pencil, dry uh, materials, marker, uh, or paint brushes. Painting is drawing. So naturally, when I add something, I just see more stuff uh, popping up, like variations of the curve. So it, it doesn't feel very regular. This is a little bit lighter. Um, so I could go on and on. And But I also have to stop myself, because uh, with charcoal, it's so rewarding. And it feels so good that um, sometimes, if we are not careful, we can turn the sketch or the crocus into a, a formal drawing. And what we're doing right now, it's just drafting, creating a baseline or a map that's gonna guide us for uh, the brushstrokes. Um, we have to be clear about what we want to achieve and what our process is gonna be like. If we want um, drawing, a monochromatic drawing, by all means, continue doing this and really, really develop it. Develop it. In fact, uh, this may be the path of uh, this painting, that it's just going to be all dry medium. You decide. If you feel comfortable, continue doing this. Um, but if your intention is to uh, switch to painting, just make sure that this doesn't get too developed um, because it's going to frustrate you and make you feel like um, you are um, getting rid of stuff that you put. All right, so I am going to... Uh, show you how I prep my palette, and um, and I'm just gonna turn this a little bit down like this. I'm gonna take some time, and you guys, if you have done this before, um, by all means, um, uh, continue with uh, staining. Staining, by the way, it's when you seal the uh, uh, paper. I'm sorry, you frame the painting surface and you seal the charcoal. So use a big brush and use neutrals uh, and a thin turpentine. But what I'm gonna do is 
I am just going to prep, prep the palette. Um, I have um, disposable palette paper, which I highly recommend, Alina, if you are working, because there's nothing more frustrating than just having to clean the palette. Uh, again, it takes a long time. I mean, a lot of effort. I wouldn't say a long time. It takes a lot of effort to uh, leave your painting and then go back to it another day. Uh, it's just It's just painful sometimes, and we procrastinate a lot. So imagine if that's already hard, imagine if I had a palette that would be with paint and dry. Do you think like I would spend time cleaning that palette? I know myself and I would be, you know what, screw this. I'm not, I'm not touching this painting ever again. <laughs> so I highly recommend um, use a disposable palette because then it's very easy to, um, uh, you know, dispose of it. And uh, I'm using titanium white, dispose of it, and then start fresh. I'm using two whites, by the way, and you don't have to have two whites, but uh, over the course of this uh, past 10 months, we've learned that uh, bringing zinc white, whoops, uh, sorry, uh, bringing zinc white um, well, helps with blending later in the painting. Zinc white is a very transparent white and it's wonderful to just blend and create soft highlights uh, and avoiding the whiteout that the titanium uh, does. So I'm gonna set my primary neutrals, I call them primary neutrals, on, um, on this side of the palette. Gray, because not everything in nature or around us is fully saturated. And gray is one of the best, best uh, colors to desaturate things out of a tube. And then my two blacks. Uh, Payne's gray. Payne's gray is a cold black, so which means that um, it, it's it has a, a very bluish note, and then Van Dyke brown, which is a warm black. Uh, I do not recommend, and nobody really does. Well, nobody. I mean, who says that? Uh, having Mars black or um, yeah, we don't even use ivory black and we don't recommend it. But having Mars black on the palette, uh, it could, the, the black is so strong and powerful that it could override any of the mixtures. So um, traditionally, uh, first of all, uh, true oil purists don't use black on their palettes. They, to make something black, they use a combination of blue and brown, for example, which creates a much more interesting black. Um, if you have to have it, uh, then find substitutes for black. Uh, and for us, Paints Gray and Van Dyke Brown are much, much better. So these are my primary neutrals. And I call them primary neutrals because uh, they're based on only two um, colors, I guess, black and white. The, um, the, the next ones, the secondary neutrals are browns. To make a brown, you need all the colors, all the primaries. Um, so that's why I just call them uh, secondary neutrals just because um, yeah they're made up a bunch of colors so this is raw umber this is burnt sienna uh, neutral brown and a, a warm brown and then also uh, I just put yellow ochre by, by the way I also organize the palette by value I just wanted to say that so from lighter to darker, and then from darker, you'll see uh, to lighter. So that's something that's very common um, in purist circles, whatever that's supposed to mean. Uh, and this is my staple palette. I always use this palette regardless of the painting. And I anticipate I'm not gonna use uh, a lot of those colors, or maybe I will, we'll see. Uh, but this is, these are my um, secondary neutrals, all the browns. Raw Umber, Burnt Sienna, Yellow Ochre, and Ecru, or also called Titanium Buff. And then I'm going to put my light neutrals, which are very pale uh, tones. Uh, this is called, um, the color is Periwinkle, but then the brand that I'm using, uh, the brand of paint that I'm using, Gamblin, it calls this color uh, Radiant Blue. And this is a uh, Salmon Rose. Sometimes the light has a uh, temperature quality. Sometimes the light in the scene um, could be warmer or cooler. And these two colors, which contain a lot of white, they're uh, essentially very good 
uh, colors to um, uh, uh, change the uh, light quality on the painting. By the way, I this is like a little silly, but um, I separate uh, my tubes in my paint box by uh, categories. So in this Ziploc, I have all the staple colors. So I know that I don't have to dig or anything inside of the paint box. Uh, I just pull this out and I know that I have, I'm gonna have all the colors right here. I highly recommend to categorize or separate the colors in your paint box because this is what happens when you dig. What happens is that some of the caps get uh, accidentally um, off the tube and, and then it, you won't find them because they get lost. I don't know what happens. Um, and, and it's just a mess. And you have, you have different brands of paint. The caps are not gonna match. And uh, so if you keep them separated, you're gonna uh, avoid uh, the excessive banging between the tubes. I'm using two liquids um, for oil, uh, the turpent uh, mineral spirits, I should say, which is the transparent turpentine uh, derivative. And then I'm using a medium. And for medium, uh, this is very personal. Some people just use linseed oil and some people just use uh, an, a synthetic medium. I like to combine a synthetic medium with a, a organic um, oil. I'm using solvent free because I don't like uh, to have fumes and this is non-toxic and the, all the oils are non-toxic by the way. Um, so I, I like to use poppy seed oil uh, just because it's a little less yellow than um, linseed oil, and um, also it slows down. It slows the drying, so I could just leave this for the weekend, and then on Wednesday um, of next week, my paint's still wet, so that's excellent. All right, and then I'm just gonna do the staining, and I'm running a little bit uh, behind, but um, okay, here we go. And but that's okay. So for the staining. I'm going to use a big brush and I'm going to go darker to lighter. So the idea is to uh, use the uh, mineral spirits as water. By the way, if you're using acrylic or uh, watercolor, then your liquids will be just water. Uh, and uh, Dina, I know you're using uh, a retarder, which is the proper way to use a water-based medium, especially acrylic that dries and it, and it gets fixed and permanent. So uh, and the only way you can really get a lot of benefits from acrylic is if you use a recharger. Um, and that requires much more experience and much more practice. I, again, I do not recommend acrylic for beginners because it's counterintuitive. You're going to get a lesser looking result and you'll feel like you are at a, a lower level in experience. It's very interesting because um, acrylic, which is a relatively new medium. I, it was created in the 50s. Um, uh, it just feels like it's easier because it dries faster and you can just uh, reapply. But it ends up having uh, a look that it, it, it just becomes less elevated. Let's put it this way. So it's counterintuitive because you think it's easier, but it just gives you uh, less um, results that have less aesthetic value. So you feel trapped uh, with acrylic. You feel like you will never be able to jump to oil because you'll, you are not achieving that uh, progress with acrylic. Um, it, just, it just doesn't make sense. It's better to jump to oil first so you can get that luxurious and random um, uh, application of color. It's just, the paintings look so much better with uh, oil. Um, and then you can just use acrylic if you feel, if you're traveling and you don't want to deal with the uh, drying time, you can use a, acrylic or watercolor. But it's the silliest thing to uh, start with acrylic if you are a beginner. I mean, and I'm sorry if you are using it, Alina, I shouldn't say that. But um, just know that uh, with oil, whatever you're doing with acrylic, it will look much more elevated, 1,000%. Uh, so I'm using darker to lighter, a little bit of the turpentine, and um, and a little bit of the turpentine, and I'm just blocking out. So right now I'm officially behind, but that's okay. I'm blocking out. So the idea of this is to create a wash. Um, 
so it's more of a technical step. Um, I want to make sure that the painting surface is wet. So essentially, that's what I'm doing. And I want to use uh, this uh, thin layer to um, uh, seal the pores. So what else is a little bit darker? So I'm just going to bring some acro on the darker spots. I also guide myself Here we go. I failed to find who said that. Okay. Drawing and painting. Sorry, I'm not as efficient as Jen. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I should have like a, I don't I don't know who. I, I had the book. I don't know. I think, yeah. Maybe they said it in a different way, but uh, yeah. yeah. Let's close. So just blocking out big brush. Don't be. Um, don't try to be super exact or perfect or anything like that. Uh, the idea is to just um, prime the surface. We'll be able to layer things on top of this. Um, so I think what I'm going to do with a little bit of gray, actually, I'm just going to speed up this process and see if I can just do a quick wash everywhere. And I recommend my sort of like approach, I recommend to cover um, your painting area with a wash because uh, there's nothing that frustrates me more than having a blank space that blank space affects my decision making um, process so i highly recommend to get everything stained and washed remove the blankness remove the um, yeah the, remove the blankness and uh, if you want to make something a little bit lighter whoops i need to put a little bit more of the turpentine Yeah, stick to neutrals if you can. Stick to neutrals if you can. Analyze your um, your palette. And um, by the way, uh, what I just created, I call it the raw material. I don't call it the color palette. The color, the raw material is always the same regardless of the subject. The color palette is always different every single time. You will never use the same color palette. Not even if you. Um, paint the same painting again. Uh, so the color palette we have to create from scratch. The raw material, we just squeeze it out of the tube. And part of the problem, or one of the things that um, I think we need to sort of like um, understand is that sometimes we, we don't process the raw material enough. We just pretend that the raw material is gonna be enough to match the color of what we're seeing. The raw material, the paint out of the tube is highly pigmented. And unless there's something popping, it's not meant to be used on a representational um, image right off the tube. It's meant to be processed. And I'm talking from a very traditional point of uh, view, obviously, no one um, tells us that we should use this or that in a specific way. But as I keep saying if, uh, in recent um, weeks, be comfortable with the uh, traditional before you break it. Um, very important. So yeah, that's kind of like my approach. Um, learn the ropes before you, um, that sounds awful. I mean, it sounds awful, but uh, there is a reason for that, I would say. Yeah, it's just for me, it's about creating healthy habits. And if I don't understand how things work or why they're being used, and notice that I'm using the rag, by the way. The rag is also a painting tool. It's a cotton rag. Um, so, yeah. And I can remove some of the paint so I can, can create highlights. This doesn't have to be perfect. And what I'm doing is I'm blocking out. I'm blocking out. Uh, really, uh, I'm not using white, by the way. And I'll tell you that in um, oil painting, if you use white pigment underneath the layers, they're going to give you trouble. Because uh, then you're going to want to make them a little bit darker, and then you won't be able to. Uh, but that's good if it happens. Actually, it's just going to make us learn that um, that happens with oil. Uh, darker first, um, lighter uh, later. 
All right. So again, uh, the photograph is a reference. The photograph is not the goal of the process. Uh, we do this because we want to exercise our observational skills. We want to um, break up habits that uh, we use, like uh, associating things with ideas rather than observing, uh, establish new habits. Uh, so there are a lot of reasons why we do this. The last one is because we want to show how good we are at proportions or realism. That is not uh, on the top of my list of criteria at all. Uh, that's just a skill. And I'm using this as a form of expression, um, meditation, understanding about myself, um, and translation, uh, what else? A lot, of, uh, a lot of things that have nothing to do with our level of uh, realism. And that's the reason why I highly suggest you guys watch the uh, inspiration video because you're gonna see different approaches, different translations uh, to mushrooms. I'm done with, uh, and it's not too bad, the first hour I'm done with the wash. So I've done the potato shape, uh, I've done the structural lines, I've done the sketch, I mean the shading, I, and I've done the wash. So I like to revisit uh, how far I've gone and where I'm at right now and how am I going to strategize um, with the remainder of my time. So I'm gonna make a, a quick stop and um, yeah, I think that's good. I'm happy with, uh, I'm happy with the wash. Yeah, so, oh, and by the way, I don't have to say this, uh, but because you guys know it, the amount of paint you have on the painting surface does not um, uh, declare or um, designate that what we're doing is a painting or not. That's a common um, observation. It, you know, in order to make it a painting, we have to put a bunch of stuff. No, we could just do a wash and still be a painting. So know that uh, the amount of paint that we put doesn't make it a painting or not a painting. I think it's important because um, sometimes I see tutorials and classes in which um, uh, people use uh, palette knives. I mean, I'm sorry, yeah, art knives or spatulas. <laughs> they just like wrap and then start adding and adding and when you have things that are too wet and too oily, um, you're gonna end up stirring that pot and you're gonna have, uh, at the end of the process, you probably will be able to do, uh, let's say eight paintings. And it sounds amazing. The problem is that those eight paintings are <laughs> underneath the same surface. Oops, sorry you guys. So, um, yeah, um, yeah, so I'm going to switch to um, the next step. And for the next step, I'm just going to um, switch to medium brushes. I'm not going to use the big brush anymore. Uh, I'm not a fan of using a ton of brushes, but um, I do feel like I want to keep the old brushes that uh, are totally terrible. I don't dump them because old brushes are excellent um, for blending. Yeah, and then uh, also I'm gonna use a new brush for the later application of paint. So I'm gonna use the old brush and what I'm doing right now, I'm not gonna use the turpentine. I'm gonna use um, the medium. So the turpentine is only gonna be to clean. And uh, let me see if I can just, uh... so yeah, uh, this will be to clean. So what I do with the uh, turpentine, I just, uh, when I switch colors, I like to um, kind of like rinse the brush, squeeze it on the edge and clean. And then this one right here at the medium will be my um, fluid. Uh, the paint out of the tube is really thick. So uh, the medium, whether it's oil or synthetic medium will help us to uh, make the painting more fluid. So I'm just going to go with the Van Dyke Brown. And right now what I'm doing, notice that um, the paint sticks 
on top of the wash and creates a little bit more opacity. So I blocked out with the wash and with this, I'm creating almost a mosaic. It's not exactly that brown. Let me just uh, tone it down with some of the paints gray. Oh yeah, I think that's a little bit more gray. And um, it's a little bit lighter on this side. I, mean, I don't want to uh, go into details of lighting yet, but yeah. So the idea, uh, what's the difference between uh, staining or a wash and first notes? With the staining, uh, the purpose is to just uh, uh, prime the paper and seal the charcoal. Uh, the first notes are meant to create um, um, uh, mosaic-like uh, areas on the painting. So um, the, they're not meant to be uh, blended or uh, added detail, but I need, uh, this is kind of like the foundation and I need uh, another foundation, I guess, on top of what I've got. <laughs> so um, yeah, uh, mosaic-like, puzzle-like pieces. I'm not blending at all. So um, what I'm gonna do is um, I'm also going to go from darker to lighter. And I'm just going to bring that color right here. And I'm going to show you guys, uh, I don't know if you um, had a chance to use this or not, but this is a painting hat that we saw uh, someone use uh, that consists of a piece of plastic, transparent plastic. Uh, this is a cellophane cover. Um, and it's pretty flat, but it doesn't have to be flat. It could be uh, a cutout um, Ziploc. And the idea, I'm sorry that it's, uh, but the idea is to be able to paint on top of your image reference to see how close uh, it is from the actual color. So I use that a lot because I want to start studying the color. Uh, sometimes we create colors on the palette. And although we're free to choose whatever we want, um, I'm obsessed with color and I, and I really want to study it. And for me, uh, to study the color is to kind of like add it uh, either, either on the edge or on top and then find out if the value is similar, meaning like the lighter darkness um, or um, the temperature, how cold um, or how warm. And doing this, yeah, uh, I just always realize that the color that I um, initially do on the palette, it's usually much more saturated and colorful than uh, I actually see it. So, yeah, I like to study that and make some changes um, and understand that, um, yeah, here we go blocking, I'm just blocking with this old hairy brush and creating more um, chunky areas, mosaic-like. I'm not worried about uh, details yet. And I, I do follow the darker to lighter uh, premise. Um, I'm not matching color, but um, here we go. I do like to study it. This is a little bit more gray. So every time I, I create a color sample, let me just uh, show you on the palette. So um, every time I create a color sample, I try to move that color sample somewhere else because I want to keep track of my color history. We have a tendency of making the same color over uh, the same puddle. And uh, it's a good idea every, every time that you make um, uh, a test or a color test, you just use a different part of the palette. Yeah, that way uh, you know the colors that you've used. And uh, if you work on it a different day, which the colors uh, on the actual paper will be dry, but you get a reference of what you've used. So it's a little bit easier um, to go back. Yeah. Um, and I use a lot of medium and that's, uh, yeah, I use a lot of medium. Again, just blocking it. Um, one of the things that I love about painting is that it teaches us um, to be 
uh, to slow down. Painting is a slow endeavor and it just feels um, weird uh, to uh, build something slowly, but it's a good lesson. <laughs> Um, and also um, humbleness. For me, it's kind of like, you know, just work, move forward, um, do one bit at a time. Uh, things may not look like uh, amount to anything yet, but um, you will see, um, you will see things forming as you work. So the idea is to, it's to work. Um, yeah, so darker to lighter. I just uh, follow the darker to lighter. Um, uh, using the rack, sometimes the rack is great to remove um, drips or anything. And I, I'm going to go now to the, to the gray on the table. Because I'm moving from um, darker to lighter. So next, and not by location, by the way. So next on that scale will be the cast shadow. Um, I read somewhere, I think it was in a forum. There's a forum uh, called Wet Canvas. It's one of those old um, style forums from the 90s, I guess. And um, a lot of uh, traditional, um, traditional, yeah, old school artists, they just go there and they just ask. Uh... Okay, I think Alexa just like uh, said something. Okay, this is going on. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, so, yeah, I. Um, in one of those forums, I highly recommend it, wet canvas. Um, I mean, people go nuts, but um, there's some really good advice. And someone there said that you should always use, or you should try to use a brush always uh, uh, bigger than what you would feel comfortable with. And I think that's a great advice because the tendency when we, when we paint, the tendency is that we always want to go smaller so we can create more definition. So we are almost like driven by um, detail and sharpness very early in the process. And it may feel good, but um, it just sl slows down the process a, lo a, lot, a lot more. And um, so I like this idea of getting familiar with working with a brush that uh, is a little bit bigger than what we would be comfortable with. And that's what I'm doing right now. So I use the uh, old hairy brush to build my first notes. I don't need to be specific right now. And by the way, I don't even have, I don't have to tell you this, but I don't have to be specific in regards of like, if the brush falls um, within the lines, the charcoal lines uh, or not. Um, so I'm gonna hold off the white. I feel like I wanna bring some white already, but I'm just gonna hold off that. And so those are the shadows. Okay, I'm just gonna build a little bit of the background uh, and I'm gonna make it cooler. And I'll use the hack. And I may need to introduce white right now. Yeah, so this is a uh, much darker. So I'll bring some titanium. I, I reserve the, um, yeah, a little bit more. I reserve the uh, zinc white for later for blending and creating uh, variations. Yeah, definitely. There's a lot of periwinkle in that background. So this, this kind of like silly thing allows me to study the color. It's amazing how we think we can match color, but we are so affected by uh, our experience with color. And unfortunately, our experience with color, the, the way I see it, um, is that we are uh, desensitized when it, when it comes to color. And I feel, I'm going to make an assumption here, I feel like it's because 
uh, color is used uh, around us uh, to grab our attention. So in publicity and on anything, you know, on TV, on a screen. Um, so one of the techniques or one of the uh, things that uh, the visual elements that people use to grab our attention is to use color. So over years and years and decades of uh, recognizing or looking at bright color first, uh, we create this pathway in our brains in which only bright color becomes visible. And it's, I, it, I mean, it, it's not a bad thing, but when it comes to being sensitive to color variations, uh, we lose out a lot of sensitivity. So I've been painting for a long time and I still feel like when I create paint, I make it way too colorful. So uh, for me, you know, testing it is great. And after I just uh, discovered this, it allows me to really study that color and find out um, the disconnect. Oh, disconnect is a very negative word, but um, the, yeah, the difference between uh, how I see color and I try to replicate it and what color actually looks like. So this is wonderful. Right now, I just added some titanium white for the first time. And I love this cool light gray. So I'm just gonna add it as a first note. Yeah, not too bad. Time-wise, not too bad. I always check the time. And of course, I don't try to match every single tone because I like uh, the idea of chance and randomness. And that's why uh, oil is so much superior to that. But once I study the color and I realize the variations, then I can make my own variations. Um, on the go. Every time you make mix color, it's just going to be different. And that's fantastic, by the way. Uh, another good example of why we use the periwinkle um, as a staple in our palette. We use it all the time, either the periwinkle or the salmon rose always. And again, the idea was to create a variation in temperature without using too much color. So uh, I created a variation of the gray uh, using that um, periwinkle note. I'm just going to add these tones. I think that's good. This is going well, uh, I think. <laughs> um, it's also important to approach things from a very um, relaxed point of view, I think. Don't take it too seriously. Uh, the result, it's not what matters, it's the process. I know that it sounds corny and cheesy, but it really is uh, the process. Uh, sometimes when you try to control it too much, um, it's when you lose more control like everything in life, really. So I think that's uh, going well. I'm not going to put all the color all the way to the edge, but um, I'm, I'm still working on first notes. I think for me, it's important to um, understand where I'm at because it gives me realistic expectations of what this is supposed to look like. If I don't know where I'm at in my process, I feel overwhelmed. I feel like I'm in a deep hole and I it, things are continuously falling on, on my eyes. So I like to break things down. I like to make um, pauses. I like to understand that this is supposed to give me this result and that's supposed to be something else that I'm not ready for yet. Because otherwise everything happens at once at the same time and I, I don't enjoy it. I always felt, um, I mean, I, I'm not super great at, an, at analogies. But I always fail, felt before um, I created some structure that painting was a game of carrying stones on my back um, and going uphill. So the more I would work, the heavier I would feel and the harder it would be, uh, become to make uh, progress. Um, and, and there was not even like a point where I, I reached um, uh, the top of anything. It was just constantly adding weight and by weight meaning like things to consider like values and shadows and details, proportions. So everything just increased in weight and responsibility. And every time it was harder to make progress. 
Uh, and uh, of course, that's not sustainable. So uh, that's uh, if there were there were two choices: either just give up uh, painting altogether, because you cannot you cannot create when you feel um, this way. You just it's not sustainable. Or just break it down into um, chapters or uh, different um, yeah different chapters. And that's what um, was a relief for me to just understand that um, there are different. Uh, different chapters and uh, I needed to create a structure and the word structure is uh, ugly because you don't associate creativity with structure but unfortunately for me um, you can't enjoy the process unless there's some form of structural uh, or structure uh, in the form of a strategy or realizing where we are and what we are supposed to be doing and what kind of expectations are supposed to um, have. Okay, here. So this would be my, uh, let me just, uh, for the sakes of what I'm doing, I'm gonna finish um, the first notes on the background. So it looks a little bit more integrated. All right. Okay, so this is gonna be, oh, there's something here that I haven't done. It's a little darker. So again, try to create uh, different um, samples. It's too dark, but that's okay. Now, this is not the final layer by all means. It's not the final layer at all. Actually, I just can bring in a new, uh, a new layer. I mean, I'm sorry, a new brushstroke. Cause I feel like this is much lighter and I haven't worked on it. I, so again, I'm doing my final touches on first notes. So I didn't put too much uh, lighter notes on, and I'm using titanium white on this. But if you notice, I tried to, uh, I would say create a mosaic-like effect. So that's the idea from darker to lighter. So I'm trying to stick to my own process. And I said, I was gonna do darker to lighter. I was gonna do pixelated. And uh, I'm finishing with lighter tones and I'm just blocking, uh, blocking them out. And a little bit of a lighter, the super, super lighted, light one on this part of the stock. Chloe, did you find anything else uh, interesting at all or any references? Are you just uh, in, in the midst of a uh, internet uh, wormhole perhaps? I, I have been reading avidly about the only species in the world that doesn't need any light to grow at all but yet can glow in the dark there no. are 30 species of mushrooms that glow in the dark and they don't only glow in the dark but they mirror the circadian rhythm of the sun okay i know <laughs> i know it's really fascinating so they're basically like they basically mimic the activity of the seabed. You know how all mm. the jellyfish and all the deep sea life have got like their own system. These guys have got a system and it's bonkers. Wow. I know. Wow. And I also have been reading about how poisonous and toxic some of them are and it was, it was really quite interesting. And, uh, and also, um, final thought, there's a, there's a new kind of emerging industry behind whether or not people want to be buried in mushroom um, coffins. And the debate is, are we waste or are we compost? And that's a big question, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but so far we've been waste because we're create you know we're we're disposed of in these highly varnished synthetically kind mm -hmm. of yeah okay. preserved coffins and really that's not it's not what we are so yeah really super amazing super. yeah um in that sense if you can find um like like um there, I think it's, she's an artist. Uh, she created this suit, like a bodysuit, 
uh, specifically for um, uh, burial uh, that contains a mushroom that she is training. <laughs> Are you ready? <laughs> this is going to be disgusting. So he's training the mushroom, giving the mushroom uh, bits of nails and skin and hair. So they acquire a taste for the human body. So they actually decompose um, the body faster. And mm. she, the, the suit is, I think it's black and it has uh, things sewn onto it. Yeah, and um, COEO, I think it's called COEO or cleanses the body and soils of toxins that would otherwise seep into the environment, delivers nutrients from body to surrounding plant roots effectively and restarts life around the body faster than normal. Okay, yeah, so I just the environment. Sign me up. So, say again. No, no, I'm just saying, you know what? I'm, I'm just gonna buy whatever. I just want that suit and everything. Just sign me up already. <laughs> I think that's beautiful. Yeah, uh, so the, their parting line is, we plant two trees for every suit or shroud bought and they, they cost far less than traditional burials and cost around $5,000. And we're basically, it's basically turns us into renewable energy. Wow, talk about it. Fascinating. I think it's fascinating. And it's a great debate about, because I see the um, ritual on the other one also, you know? So, all right, okay, well, um, if you can add any glow in the dark mushrooms, because <laughs> I'm dying <laughs> right now. <laughs> and also, if you can find the suit or the mushroom, because I'm just going to put my name down already for one. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks, Chloe. Um, yeah, so let me know um, when you add them. But that's absolutely fascinating, actually. Yeah, uh, look at us. Uh, we initially wanted to just paint mushrooms because they're pretty and stuff. And now we're talking about mortality and the meaning of um, life. Um, I love when that happens. So this is my um, uh, final first note stage. And um, so possibly I, it, uh, I'm delayed in the process, but that doesn't mean like uh, this is right or wrong because ultimately the way I approach each of these kind of like chapters that I talked about is that uh, I feel like, uh, I'm ready to move on to the next chapter when I feel comfortable about, or when I, when I get a sense of like static joy about um, the expectation that I had with that um, uh, chapter. Let, let me just kind of like put it into practice. If this were um, only like a charcoal drawing, uh, so then I would just um, be able to walk away from what I did at the beginning and be fine with it. Um, I recommend to feel like you're able to walk away from whatever stage you are and then be fine with it as a, as a way of um, building on your progress without having to go through the entire progress uh, process and then just finding uh, some sort of joy in the final result. In my experience, um, it's unrealistic. And um, to be honest with you, we may feel happy about a, a, a painting um, after we've done like maybe 10 of them. And then one of those really captures our, you know, emotions. So I'd rather uh, sort of like find aesthetic value in each of the steps. So this is my first um, note process. And I feel, I feel it's nice. So I'm just gonna explain with the next uh, half an hour, I'm gonna explain what a second notes stage is, what it means. And, um, and also, uh, sorry, guys, I'm just going to put some socks on because my feet are cold. And what it means to um, to go through second notes, what's the difference between first notes and second notes. And yeah, here we go. All right, so for uh, second notes, um, which means that it's, again, a new layer on top. So I went from dry sketch to staining to first notes. And now I'm just gonna move to what I call or what it's called really second notes. So the difference is that instead of using uh, uh, puzzle pieces or blocks, the way it kind of like I build this with, with blocks without blending anything, 
I'm gonna use a brush that it's not gonna be the old hairy guy. It's just gonna be uh, still medium, but a little bit um, younger. <laughs> and um, I'm gonna start uh, pixelating a little bit. So instead of like blocking out, there's gonna be more of a pixelated brush stroke. And the main difference is that instead of working by value, I'm gonna work by location this time. So I'm gonna stick with one area, whatever I decide to work on and develop the highs and lows of values of color in that area. So for example, uh, uh, let's say I'm just gonna start with this cap right here. So I have like a lot of yellow ochre and white. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create more variations between the colors that I have. I only have two right here. I don't know if you can see, but I only have two. So I'm gonna create more variations within um, uh, these two areas. Um, and the way I'll do it is by uh, just applying uh, tiny strokes. Um, so, and also bringing more variations of color in between. With oil, this is so satisfying. Why? Because the paint, it's still um, wet. So I can blend. With acrylic, you can't do that. You have to repaint over again. And um, it's much more difficult. And it's, it just sets up the habit of like doing a million paintings underneath the surface of the work. So yeah, let's just go back. I'm using medium, uh, medium only. I'm just gonna go back. And I realize that this is a little bit more on the neutral side. So I'm just gonna remove uh, the yellow ochre and just bring um, some, and I think, uh, and yeah, I'm just gonna bring some, I still work darker to lighter, but I do it within um, one location. And I realize in this location that the light has a warmth um, quality to it in this little pocket right here. And guess what? This is when the salmon rose comes in and says, hi, uh, because it's not all brown. And I didn't see that quality. I didn't see that quality, but I can see that there's almost like a pinkish note. So um, this is what second notes really means. And um, the way I work on this, it's by, um, creating small strokes and also trying not to stir the paint too much. And I'll probably explain um, in, in, before I continue, I'll explain that um, I found an artist, I forgot his name, uh, that categorizes uh, or categor yeah, categor he categorizes painting based on location. I mean, I'm sorry, blending. I'm gonna talk about blending now. Categorizes blending uh, based on location. Uh, and I find, I find it really helpful because uh, I'll explain uh, what didn't happen in my mind before I learned that. He says that we uh, blend either on the palette or we blend on the painting. Sometimes we blend on, most likely on both, but um, it just depends on where we blend that we're gonna uh, create different effects. So this is what happened before I understood that um, there's blending by location. I would blend a lot on the palette. I would just make the color and bring some of the rose and some of the dark or some of the light. And then I would also blend on the painting. So I would do double blending, blending on the palette until I thought I had the color. But then when I would put the color right here, I would continue blending with the colors uh, nearby. And naturally, I would just uh, create a muddy porridge-like uh, area. Because when you have the color and then you blend it with the colors that you have there, you, you just kind of like overwork that color. So the idea that I'm going to say, or I'm going to explain right now with second notes, try to blend much more on the palette and avoid blending as much as you can on the painting. So when you add the tones, they remain the same color as what you did on the palette. Because otherwise you'll make color on the palette and then you'll continue to change the color on the painting. 
right, so that's what I wanted to say. I hope it makes uh, sense. So what I'm doing right now is I'm adding, and that's why I like to call this um, process kind of like pixelation, because I don't blend or I try to avoid uh, too much blending on the painting. I create the color on the palette and then I just apply it. There we go. Yeah, and what if I wanna blend? So uh, if I wanna blend, I'd rather not have any color on my brush at all. And then just focus on the blending on the existing colors that I have on the palette. I mean, on the painting, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm just confusing you even further. So here we go. I just blend without any color, any additional color. Let's move, let me put it this way. A little bit maybe of the zinc white. I think right now the zinc white could be a great color to add. The titanium white, it's very powerful. Here we go. Zinc white, it's much softer. Maybe some titanium would be good here actually. So I clean the brush and then, then I observe and some things that, uh, one thing that I'll have to do, it's not only I have to paint the actual object, but I also have to bring uh, the relationship between the actual object and the background. So during second notes, that interaction it just happens a little bit more. So I uh, now I'm working on the background, but I'm working on the background in a way that helps me um, redraw almost or draw, um, yeah, the background a little bit more. I couldn't um, reinforce this anymore. Be careful with regular curves. Um, we want to make sure that um, we keep that organic energy um, with the mushroom and not make it super rigid and artificial looking. Um, so yeah, as I add, I'm using titanium white because I need this to be a little bit lighter. As I add uh, paint on the outside of the shape, I draw it, I manipulate it. That edge is moving, it's not static. And that's, an, and look how much development I got with two minutes. This is, a, uh, I would say, I'm just gonna give myself credit. How about that, you know? Um, it's a good example on how you can achieve a lot of development with very little time if you don't overwork something. Again, you don't want to have 10 paintings underneath the surface of your work. Uh, it's just like a manic, if I can say that word. Um, slow down and don't overwork the blending on the painting. Try to blend more on the palette, less on the painting, I hope you're using oil, but if you use acrylic, you need some sort of retarder because you won't be able to achieve um, that chance and randomness uh, with acrylic alone. Acrylic will dry on you super fast and then you'll just have to, um, yeah, go over again. I'm gonna bring some uh, zinc white alone and I'll explain um, why Zinc white, it's an excellent paint uh, to blend. Um, yeah, just because it's so transparent. I have some charcoal, I have a gap right there. So what I do is just with the zinc white, just with the zinc white, I'm just going over very gently. And it's almost like a, like a medium. It acts like a, uh, um, as a medium. There's a little bit of... Um, uh, Ecrotone, and I see some rose. Again, the quality of light. How do you paint light? Um, you paint light by looking at the quality of 
that light reflecting on the objects. So naturally there's no, uh, light is invisible in the scene, but I can see the quality of the light by looking at the temperature on the light reflecting and the value reflecting on uh, the objects, the surfaces, I should say. So, um, I'll say it a million times, avoid blending too much on your painting. It's the problem that, um, or not a problem, it's a habit that we have because we feel like, you know, we have to work it even further. And then we found ourselves saying, oh my gosh, oil is so difficult. It's, you know, it's impossible. It's not the oil, it's us. Um, so keep it uh, minimum uh, to a minimum or don't overwork. Um, the blending, don't force the blending uh, too much. All right, so I just created um, and I try to close the gap. I still feel like there's too much darkness on this edge. So perhaps uh, with some of that brown, I just could um, uh, blur it. I love uh, creating soft blurry edges. Look, perfect, that's it. I'll look at the difference between uh, this edge with heavily charcoal and then the blurry one. Uh, things in nature or from life, um, they're actually not super sharp. We have this obsession and that's uh, one of the reasons why painting, of course I'm biased, it's one of the best things you can do to keep your sanity. It's the fact that I love technology and I love uh, advances on technology, but there is this obsession with cameras and phones and TVs to become sharper and sharper and sharper. You know, um, we are obsessed by it. Um, and nothing numbs our painter's eye more than having that obsession. Because in nature, <laughs> things are not that crystal clear. Um, humidity in the air, the particles of water uh, create softness on the edges. Um, so when we watch, I remember not anymore because I think, oh no, I've been to a Best Buy um, recently, you guys. Uh, oh my gosh, I should be embarrassed, but I'm not. But I remember years ago uh, going to Best Buy and just standing in front of the TVs, all the big screen TVs. And there was always a documentary or something with water, you know, and it was like so sharp. It was so sharp. It was nuts. Um, that's not the way we look at nature. There's softness, there's uh, water in the air. The edges are not sharp. So I use that same science, I would say, um, to, uh, and I apply it to um, the way I paint. So some edges, I purposely make them less defined just because I want to create that natural, look at this more natural look of the surface of the cap of the mushroom continuing beyond that edge. If you make it extra sharp, it's gonna look like collage, cut and paste. So work the edge quality on your uh, painting. So not everything needs to be extremely sharp. So if you put everything together, like extremely sharp edges with highly saturated color um, and a lot of blending, what we end up is with a painting that is very um, compartmentalized and flat looking. So I put an example of Yayoi Kusama, uh, the Japanese artist uh, that she does uh, precisely that. And my point is that I'm not saying one is good, the other one is bad. Learn the ropes of the traditional before you break the rules. That's all I'm saying. Uh, okay, let's uh, less talking and more painting. I should uh, I should say so. Um, I'm uh, let me do the gills because I love that. Just gonna oh, and there's there's such a thing as detail composition, by the way, which I'm really fascinated about. Um, we always talk composition in a sp sp spatial terms, you know, arranging things within a space. Composition applies also to other criteria. 
uh, for example, the level of detail. On a painting, on a painting, I could artistically decide what part of the painting will contain more detail and what part of the painting will um, be more underdeveloped. It's an artistic choice that makes the painting much more interesting than a photograph. So don't feel like you have to create the same amount of detail everywhere. No one's telling us that. It's a creative choice. So part of the strategy of a painting should be for us to stop, look at the subject and decide, what do I want to contain more density of detail and what's going to have less density of detail? It's just gonna take the painting to the next level. So I'm gonna concentrate more detail on this mushroom cap underneath. And for the first time, I'm gonna bring a small brush right now. One of the things that is beautiful about mushrooms is the different textures that we get. Again, variation, variation of detail development and density, variation of texture will push the painting forward. It's not the amount of, um, uh, or the exactness of proportions that make a painting interesting. That's just like skill to me. It's the creative decisions that the artist takes that are visible with a painting in regards of how much detail one area has re in, um, in regards of or compared to other areas. How are the edges treated? Um, what's the uh, treatment of different um, textures that the artist decided to do? Those things grab me because they're very personal. Uh, they're personal decisions uh, by the artist. All right, so let's kind of like stop that nonsense. So with a tiny brush, I'm just uh, creating the idea of the gills and I don't have to make them all the way, but that alone already gives me a good sense of the gills. And I'm gonna use zinc white for this area because I want softness. Um, okay, I think that's very good. Uh, because of the perspective, some of the gills, they read all um, soft. So with my old hairy brush, just gonna bring um, all those um, surfaces right here. I'm just gonna soften them. Soften, 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 soften. So I have soft and I have sharp. So right now I'll just bring um, a medium brush and I'm just gonna bring some of the, oops, some, I'm gonna bring some of that tone with um, lighter tone uh, to paint the gill area. I try to follow the directions of the gills, the radiating directions. And there's this uh, slightly darker edge, but then there's also some darkness on the other side. So yeah, that's good, I'm happy. So with a dry brush or a brush without paint, I'm gonna blend um, the edges of things here a tad more. And um, yeah, again, I'm trying not to over blend. If I do blend, I start by um, using a dry brush and taking advantage of the fact that the paint uh, is wet, I'm sorry, uh, to soften um, those edges. Yeah, it's not too bad. I'm just gonna bring this white edge. Okay. And time-wise, okay, good. I have like, I'm gonna um, extend it five minutes. So I have 15 minutes and second notes are, um, it's the stage that takes the longest. All the stages before second notes, they feel to me very foundational. So right now it's when I'm really uh, 
developing or bringing everything together. Okay, and then I'll just uh, continue. I'm actually going to bring the stock some lightness on the stock. And with titanium white, I really want it um, super bright. Okay, I think that's got just popping right now. And um, with, again, with medium, sometimes it all it requires is a little bit of medium. I just blend um, between those um, two edges. Yeah, I think that's good. I think that's good. Uh, oil is wonderful also because um, when I apply the brush strokes, it just gives me um, uh, some random effect. And I love that. I just love the fact that it looks like painted. By the way, um, in that sense, I'm gonna bring up the fact that I, I'm pr pretty sure you guys have um, seen it. <laughs> you know, the news just keep getting worse, I guess, or whatever. But yesterday, um, Time Magazine revealed the person of the year. I mean, whatever, Time Magazine is, I don't know. Uh, um, anyhow, so um, uh, it's um, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, and it's a portrait. It's an actual um, painting. So when I first uh, saw the cover of Time magazine revealed yesterday by Bruce Springsteen, by the way, <laughs> he revealed the cover. Uh, I thought it was a photograph. Um, I, I, I just thought it was a photograph. But no, in fact, um, as I was getting uh, closer and I was actually looking, it's a painting. And at first I was like, wow, that's pretty amazing. Because it's if you look at it, it's an actual painting. But then I was a little bit conflicted. So maybe we can talk about it later if you guys want. Because I thought, well, it's painted, but it doesn't look like a painting. And I have an issue with that because why are we painting it if it's not gonna look like there's some brush strokes on it? I just don't get it. Um, so I love the, um, of course, I love the fact that um, they're on the cover. Uh, I, I just love the fact that, you know, the, they got featured and it's a beautiful painting. It just looks too photographic to me. <laughs> so the reason why I went on this tangent is because on oil, I love the fact that oil just creates some random effects that uh, some of them I like to keep because ultimately I want this to look like it's painted. Um, otherwise, I don't know why I'm using, what's the, the point of using uh, paint at all. So uh, embrace those quote unquote mistakes or um, um, imperfections because that make the work look actually um, more authentic and genuine and uh, made by a human. Oh, and also Chloe, if you're still there, I was just, I'm just jumping from one subject to another, but I was looking at mushrooms. Uh, I didn't find any articles, but uh, I found a reference that mushrooms have been traditionally used as dyes uh, for fabric and stuff like that. And I, I didn't have time, but I was wondering if uh, any kind of like mushrooms were ever used to create uh, pigment for paintings. I don't know. I mean, um, it would be interesting to find out if there's actually. I found a bunch of information. Um, the, there's different types of mushrooms like the chanterelle um, creates a yellow. Um, the artist's conch is rust. Um, so there's like a list of and there's also like a lobster mushroom, which creates like a real bright cinnamon pink. Wow. Um, so yeah, they, they historically were used to dye fabric, but I didn't find anything um, out there about to create paint pigment, but it's pretty strong. And some of the colors are really um, vibrant. 
Wow. Wow. Interesting. Mm. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was wondering because uh, I know that um, we talked about alizarin crimson recently, um, a relatively new uh, synthetic pigment. And uh, I was reading about how it was discovered as a pigment. And some of those synthetic uh, pigments, um, there was a, a chemical process that uh, was able to turn the dye into a pigment. Before that technology, um, there was no crossover between dyes and pigments um, for painting, for art. It was all mineral based or, you know, um, it was either a true pigment from nature um, or nothing else. But with a lizard and crimson, um, this uh, scientist or uh, whatever uh, was able to turn the dye um, into a pigment. And that was the breakthrough, the actual um, um, breakthrough. So I was wondering if there's um, any dye that came, um, was transformed into a pigment um, that came from a mushroom. But yeah, anyhow, thanks for checking. That's very helpful and interesting. Um, I was also reading uh, something very interesting about uh, uh, species of mushrooms or rather fungi that uh, coexist with us. And they identified, I think, dozens, but I think there are four or five or six that are the most common. And uh, some scientists uh, use the term, you know, that there's a term, the biome, uh, and that's um, the environment where bacteria coexist with us. Um, I think there's a term uh, related to uh, fungi uh, called the uh, mycome or something like that, um, that refers to the existing fungi that coexist with us. Uh, I found that very interesting because um, I, when, when, we, when we think like fungus and human um, human bodies, we think like the the wrong kind of like fungus, you know, the candida and all sort of like fungal infections. But apparently, um, just like with the biome with the bacteria, there is an equ equilibrium between the existing fungi and our bodies, and we all have candida and stuff like that. And it's all about how we keep it in check. So I just found that very interesting that they're part of us as well as bacteria. Um, yeah, and um, all right. So just going back to what I'm doing right now, still in second notes, I just brought some uh, detail uh, on this uh, cap and underneath it. And I was doing some work on the light. And I feel like I'm gonna go there in the next, in the final five minutes. Cause sometimes we focus on what's more exuberant and, and what grabs more attention. But I'm uh, encouraging you to look at the uh, peripheral areas. Cause sometimes um, working on the background and also on the things like uh, cast shadows will directly elevate the detail of work uh, on more predominant areas without even doing anything to them. So um, I'm just gonna work on those, those areas. So for example, I just wanna bring some light um, underneath. So it looks like this mushroom is not really touching the surface of the, of the table. And it has a continuity on the other side. I'm just trying to build that. And again, I'm not trying to be super specific, but I bring my old hairy guy. Uh, don't throw any old brushes. And I use the old hairy guy almost like a, as a makeup tool to blush the edges. I try to be measured in that movement because I don't want to stir too much. But yeah, to create some softness. 
again, the idea of creating variations from sharp uh, to soft and all um, things in between. I'm gonna bring some zinc white because I need this, uh, maybe a little bit of titanium. The stock right here, it's too um, shaded. So I just wanna bring back that. Why? Because I wanna create the pairing of the illusion of cylindric uh, shape on both stocks and also reinforce the idea of a light direction that's very specific in the scene. So the combination of uh, correlating that highlight on two different spots and also correlating the cast shadow will give me a very strong idea of space, an illusion of space. Uh, most of the time, you know, we just think of detail and we don't think of the light quality and the light direction. So I encourage you to stop and assess um, how the light it's really affecting uh, the painting. I mean, the, yeah, the scene. Yeah, I think that's good. In fact, I feel like I need to lighten this up because it's too regular. Again, anything that becomes too symmetric, too regular, I my eyes go there and I try to break up that symmetry. So right now, a uh, few more minutes and I'm working on, maybe I just need to, I'm gonna use a zinc white and blurry this uh, part of the stock on this area. Cause I just feel like I need to start closing gaps, tidying up some areas. So I don't have charcoal and things feel a little bit more integrated, beautiful. Just wanted to kind of like uh, close that gap there um, this feels right being sharp, but I want to make sure that it's not uh, too parallel. Again, uh, this idea of mushrooms showing that growth or that energy. And a little bit of gray. Oh, this is uh, so good. I just feel that this was very satisfying actually. <laughs> Uh, to paint is very forgiving at the same time challenging um yeah i'm really happy about variations again don't excessively blend on your painting that's just gonna make it a little bit of an issue um so i'm gonna use the final like a uh, couple of minutes to tell you uh what's gonna happen next um, so we're gonna take a 10 minute break it's uh, five minutes after one, so we'll reconvene at 1.15. Um, we are in Pacific time, but if you're joining us from anywhere else, uh, just calculate that 10-minute uh, break. Please um, use it to, first of all, to stretch, because, you know, when we are concentrated uh, physically, uh, our bodies have a tendency to get tense. So uh, our shoulders, so do all kinds of, like, stretching. And, of course, which I didn't bring my tea, drink water, and uh, all the things that we forget doing when we are so amazingly absorbed by the process of creating. I'm so happy about my mushrooms. I'm really excited. So uh, the next thing that um, I'm gonna ask you to do, take a picture of um, your painting and then upload it on the uh, folder. So we can do a little bit of a group critique it's always very helpful. Uh, I try to be uh, constructive in the sense that I try to provide elements that uh, you may want to consider in order to move the painting forward. It's never a critique about, oh, well, this looks like this or that doesn't look like that. So, um, and it's also very helpful for everyone else because anything that I may say to one painting, other people really um, can apply it to their own process. So you're not obligated to talk about, this is not gonna be a show and tell in which you have to do your presentation. I, I do most of the talking. Um, I'm gonna leave the microphones uh, open. So feel free to interact if you want. And that's going to be in 10 minutes. And uh, you can also alternatively, it's very easy to drop the uh, photographs, but alternatively, um, here's my, um, 
uh, cell phone, if you want to uh, text me that uh, image, I can, I can upload it for you. So again, I'm going to be solo. And Chloe, if you're there, fine. That would be amazing. I mean, fine. Uh, but I know it's very late for you. So um, uh, I hope to see you in 10 minutes. If not, um, yeah. So thanks for today. I'm going to pause the recording and I'll see you in 10 minutes. Bye. Let me just uh, resume. Oh my gosh. Um, those paintings. I am so excited to share the album. This is just so good. Oh, this is so good. Thank you. And I hope you uh, 10 minutes. I mean, it's amazing how um, time flies. Uh, the, the two hours barely give us time to deal with something. <clears throat> And then when I say 10 minutes, I just <laughs> didn't have time to do much. But <clears throat> let me just share the album. And I just love the paintings so much, you guys. Thank you so much for working on this. I know some of you are still working. Uh, you can upload um, as we speak. Uh, so I'll try to split up my time accordingly so we can uh, do some feedback to all those who upload it and uh, i'm gonna start i don't know if you are still here chloe are you still here yeah okay awesome so since it's very late um where, where you are i'm just gonna start with you so if you don't mind uh, so what is this <laughs> I mean, what kind of mushroom is it? I love the the shiny. Mm. Um, shiny. You to, uh, find out the actual name or something, or yeah, I will. Okay. Um, I I love uh, what you did. I just think this is spectacular. In my opinion, much better than the photograph. It's such an interesting painting, uh, composition wise. It's amazing. But the combination of lavender and purple uh, with that green, the combination of object and background, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. So great um, uh, uh, image reference. I think this is very interesting. And in, in the fact that it's taken from above, so it's an interesting point of view. You can see some of the gills, but uh, not too much, so it's a very interesting point of view. It, uh, the point of view alone alone gives me a sense of narrative. So someone took the photo um, leaning down. So to me, that um, idea of size, something that's small and someone really big took the photo. Um, so this painting is not only interesting in the uh, sense of the color palette, but uh, the narrative of it, I find it very interesting. And, so uh, notes that I would mention, um, I would say, uh, if anything, the spaces between, if you wanted to, in case that you wanted to sort of like continue or add some touch-ups, I would just uh, work on the spaces between those uh, elements. Because there is something really cool about the flaring up um, of the edges, perhaps. Uh, yeah, that's beautiful. Uh, but then, to me, there's a separation between the cap and then the the ground so i feel that's like you have it right here this darker green just yeah. pulls away the background uh from the actual cap so i know that that's a little bit darker but um i don't know i would play around with uh with that sense of uh, darker light uh, especially underneath the cap okay thank you but yeah it's just it's beautiful. I love the sap green. Did you use sap green? I did, yeah. It's gorgeous. What a great combination, this color with the purple. I never, I never thought of it as a combination, but I think it's just so great. The pinks and the green, it's beautiful. Thank you. My pleasure, thank you. <laughs> and not only that, but you did some amazing Wait, no, that's not you, is it? No. <laughs> what is this? That was just a, a reference point from the mushrooms I mentioned and the colors they produce. Oh, no way. So that's the dye. Yeah. 
how beautiful is this alone? So Beautifully curated. The yarn, the fabric, illustration of the mushroom, it's so good, I can't stand it. <laughs> it's beautiful. Did you add any um, reference to it? No, never mind. I will, I will. Okay, awesome. I'll pop that in there now. Um, yeah, I think it's amazing. Uh, and um, a good example of natural colors, you know. Um, I love browns and ecrus and orange and yellow ochres and these really, really pale, I would say almost um, um, burned umber or raw umber right here. So thanks for adding that. Uh, glow in the dark. Well, let's just kind of like savor uh, um, the another image. Thanks, uh, Chloe, for uploading that. Uh, Cap Gills. Oh, Annalise. That's an even. Yeah, another, right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to go there, but that's an interesting word. Annalise and Volva. There you go. <laughs> Happy Friday. <laughs> Say that again. Happy Friday. Yeah, yeah. I love it. Good. Yeah. Well, thanks. We learned something else. So um, thanks so much. And those are the, Chloe, did you find out if that's uh, clay? I didn't know. Um, oh. I think um, I think it is, though. I, re I recollect a message. Okay. Yeah, from Dina. Well, Dina, thanks so much for... Um, just bringing this reference, I think this is just another amazing thing to collect. Uh, I would love to, um, yeah, uh, have one. <laughs> it's so beautiful. And um, yeah, there's something aesthetically about mushrooms that I think it captures the imagination of all of us. You know, they're in children's books. They're in, I don't know, I just feel like it's, there's something uh, and I'm going to say something corny, but really magic about the aesthetics and the shape. And this is an example of someone uh, creatively using them in a different way. So, um, but yeah, uh, glow in the dark, come on, come on. This is just beautiful. This could have been a great painting also, um, actually. I, I regret not bringing those ones because imagine uh, using more of a neon style where, where the colors are much more saturated and then they create light um, themselves. Oh, look at this amazing piece of art. Um, absolutely incredible. I mean, these are images, um, just, do they look like that actually? Or they were like in hands or something? No, that's what they look like. And the only visual difference between them and jellyfish are the tendrils. So where the mushroom has the, has the, um, what is the name? You know, the, the, the state, the stem. Yeah. Uh, and then what happens under the ground with the mushroom is the mushroom has the mycopene, literally tendrils that connect with other mushrooms, but the, um, the jellyfish obviously don't connect with anything apart from the water and they transmit their um, communication through the water, through the tendrils. So they're, ex they're, they're exactly the same. It's bonkers. Wow. And also there was, I'll, I'll find the image in a second, but they were talking about other things that have this bioluminescent um, glow in the world. And there's caves there's these caves in the world that are filled with these mushrooms that glow in the dark. So they light the caves up. Oh no. <laughs> the same thing happens under, under the sea. Yeah. With the, with the, all the um, phosphorescent sea life. Oh, I'm so it's happy. Like a mirror, it's like mirror activity. That's just to talk about alien life, you know, in a way. I've it's never drawn those parallels before. So it's really nuts. Wow. Wow, it's yeah, fascinating. I, I've never knew this. I've never knew this. I mean, this is just that uh, takes you to the next level. It just, um, it's so good that we do this, not just because of the paintings, obviously, but we learn so much about things that, you know, there's so much bullshit that takes up so much space. Sorry, I'm saying this, that I find so much value in 
putting all that BS aside and really digging deep in things that are at my age, I, I never encounter or learn about. So, by the way, this reminds me of another thing that I forgot to mention. Have you heard or have you checked the uh, mushroom circles? If you haven't, check it out because apparently I didn't have time to go deep into that, but there is an effect that happens where um, mushrooms, they grow in circles and no one can explain why. And uh, it's part of like a, a also a lot of old tales and legends, but there is a way of mushrooms. Uh, sometimes they just grow in circles. Um, so, and I'm just uh, putting my name down on whatever that is, but <laughs> I love this suit. <laughs> Mushroom suit digests your body after you die. Sign me up. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm, I'm not going to do... Um, well, who knows, but I'm all for it. <laughs> I think this is beautiful. And thanks for the website. I'm going to check it out. And I, I think I know uh, an artist, of course, uh, did that. Um, but I just, I'm, I just love the context. <laughs> I wonder where this was. <laughs> But I want to know more about it. It just looks like a convention center or, or something. And the figure just laying down with this, I, I think it's just brilliant. Um, uh, so thanks for sharing that. That's another thing that I'm fascinated. Okay, so Jackie, I can't stand your painting. It's so freaking good. <laughs> oh my gosh, this is the best painting you've done, period. It's amazing and I love it. And I don't have the image reference, but um, let me just see if you upload it or not. You don't have to. Um, I just love everything about this, um, especially the visual planes and the way you brought them together. It is so exquisite. Uh, the fact that you have this green on the background that's more tilting towards Viridian. Viridian, sorry. Yeah. Uh, which has a little bit more blue and reads almost aqua. And it's cascading down and it's smoky. And then you have this beautifully desaturated uh, and heavily texturized um, sap green forward. Uh, excellent combination of both texture and um, color. Um, it just brings such idea of like depth and perspective. Thank you. And Excuse me, but those two mushrooms peeking through, uh, I just can't. This color is, is so beautiful. <laughs> this is such a good painting. Thanks. Thank you so much for doing it. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I hope you had fun. I just want to oh, great time. I'm sorry, say that again. I said I had a great time, always. <laughs> uh, you, you know what? I just... Um, you wanted to thank you for creating such a beautiful thing. It's just so good. I, I, love, I love the darkness, by the way, compared to other pieces that you've done. Let's kind of like focus on um, uh, pieces that you've done before. Love the darkness, uh, the heavily dark image. I think this is uh, a, de a point of departure because most of the paintings that you've done have a lot of light reflections and uh, games with light. Mm -hmm. um, but this is like different in the sense that it's really dark and then the light it's concentrated on the actual mushrooms. Compositionally, I couldn't be uh, happier in the sense that it has a really nice balance between what's grounded and what's in the background. And you leave enough room to just wander around the two mushrooms. I also love the, 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 the playfulness of having one just going up and the other one just being horizontal. There, this kind of like um, uh, 90 degree angle, it's so mm -hmm. good. Um, the way you treated the light on, on the cap, it's also excellent. Uh, the fact that um, it's monochromatic, um, but it has a really nice distinction with the greens. Don't touch it, it's done. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, yeah, uh, excellent. I, I'm just going to share it uh, because it's just fantastic. Thanks. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> cool. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. It's really good. Um, 
And I'm just uh, to Claire. I, this is just uh, amazing. Wow. <laughs> I also hope you have a lot of fun with it. This looks so I good. I totally had fun with it, Julio. I, you know, I rushed home to do this assignment. I, I wasn't sure I'd be able to do it, but when I went in close, there's a bug. So oh. I made the bug a spider, but that's, wow. a, there's a, if you, the photo was in the photos you posted. Look at this amazing brush stroke, Claire. <laughs> Thanks. Well done. It's gorgeous. Okay, let's just, I put the photo right next to it. Yeah. It's an incredible image. Um, oh, it is. Is it? Yeah, it is it is in a spider, but it, it's like a dead bug. Oh, cool. Yeah, so that's a very rich, I mean, obviously, this is a very rich image. I love how you cropped it, and you have like warmth and coolness, so I think that, I'm sorry, um, I think that's very good. The painting, it's much superior in the sense that you uh, took the creative decision of darkening the background. And I think that's a good idea. Um, compositionally, congrats, A plus. Um, <laughs> Thanks. I always uh, approach the critique in the sense that I look at the arrangement and then I try to look at the drawing. And then I always leave color and texture later uh, because I don't think that's as important. So I think compositionally, this is very good. It just gives me space to really admire the object and it feels centered. Um, it doesn't feel off frame. Um, I, it works really well. Uh, you left enough space at the bottom to have uh, the grass just grow on the stalk. So that creates a sense of perspective. And um, I love the coolness of the background and how this uh, grass uh, gradually uh, gets darker as it uh, sort of like uh, uh, goes away from us. It's just really beautiful. Um, I love the color palette so much because I feel like the photograph is almost too colored. Mm. But what you did is saturating that red and creating more variations within that range with the orange, the burnt orange and the browns. It's just wonderful, Claire. I used only like four or five colors. I used Bain's gray, burnt sienna, white, ecru, and the, the green and a uh, yellow. I think it's amazing. And especially uh, the stock looks really, really well developed. And in that sense, Claire, I just want to point out to not only you, but everyone, this is a good example on how uh, to distinct um, raw material, raw material um, from color palettes, you can create an amazing color palette with very few uh, paints or very few colors that it feels like it's really processed um, in a way that uh, doesn't look like out of a tube. So well done. I think this is a good example of um, a, 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 a very rich color palette from a very simple uh, raw, material, raw material selection. Thanks, Julio. Yeah, it's just a, I'm thinking of doing the same image with different color backgrounds, ooh. like a dark red, an orange, um, maybe just monochromatic. I, this is a show, show. I will tell you that whatever you have this painting in your house or whoever is seeing it, they will point it and say, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> It's actually, I don't want to post it on social media because I'm giving it as a gift. So I, yeah. Okay. Well, good to know. Yeah. No, I mean, that's good. It's just beautiful. I just don't Thank have anything, you. anything to say. You know, it's great job. Great job. Thank you for joining. Thank you. It was so much fun. Cool. Um, and I'm just gonna go, uh, Dina, wow, amazing. I love that you chose uh, this image um, and I love what you did with it. Uh, I, I, look, this is such a cool um, uh, photograph in the sense that, you know, you have a crowd. It's not just like a single one. I love like how these paintings look so different from each other. Um, so, uh, you know, starting from Chloe, like a uh, higher point of view, it's still sort of like a gathered um, group of um, uh, mushrooms, but this is more like a lower uh, perspective and they just feel like um, 
people. <laughs> I don't know, there's something really approachable about uh, the image that you chose, I just uh, talking about the image. And I love what you did, you know, sort of like a, uh, the background sort of like faded uh, the background and just concentrated on the actual, um, what is it called? Uh, not the trunk, but the cover or the coat. Cap, the cap. Um, the actual wood. What oh, oh the wood, the bark. Yeah, the bark, thank you so much. Yeah, so uh -huh. I think um, I think that's actually excellent. Um, Love the way the mushrooms are treated and painted. And that's a good example of how uh, a good illustration on what I said earlier about uh, the brushstroke of being visible. You know, the, 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 we don't have to make perfect edges because that's not, in my opinion, it's a personal a subjective opinion, but that's not the point. So I just love this loose, but very dynamic uh, strokes on, um, the vulva of uh, the mushroom. They, they just feel really um, static. And also they, they are very well grounded on the bark of the tree. Um, Thanks. Yeah. Really I, have, awesome. I have some work to do because, because of the background color, um, you know, it takes away from the, you know, you lose the, uh, there's not enough contrast. So I'm going to work on that. And so that they'll pop more. I love how, um, uh, um the the background was treated by um was it julie or julie yeah, yeah mm -hmm. with the background you know how it was like um really pretty and i was kind of tempting that but i'm, I'm not, not really sure because i didn't i didn't want this to be too busy you know how if i right. if i kind of tried to mimic that it was like too much so yeah. i'm gonna go back to the drawing board and see what I can do and then kind of uh, define the mushrooms a little bit more. But it was a little bit different from my other stuff because I, they're more paint strokey, like, you know, like how you were saying. And um, I had to bring in um, a green because it was, you know, the green from my normal right. palette is just too, it's not brilliant enough. So it was just enough. Um, to make it pop a little bit more but uh yeah it was really fun and reading thank you again for choosing the topic because you know we don't realize how many variations of of mushrooms there are i mean it's crazy uh in asian culture and cooking they eat the um the fungus the black fungus which is you know the wood they're called wood ear mushrooms and they 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 grow on the side of the bark and that's why they cut they look like ears on on the trunk of the tree but it it's uh they're kind of rubbery tasty thin and they mix it with vegetable dishes but it, it's it's just amazing the the vast amount of species or different varieties of mushrooms so it was definitely, and I liked, I put a link for mushroom terrariums and I'm gonna try and temp, attempt one of those two later on today, just a small version. Mm -hmm. But they put the mushroom, there's a much, and I would only like include like one or two mushrooms and they've got little lights in the terrarium and it no. just is really magical. <laughs> so I put the link in, in the, the chat too. Oh, okay, to I'm gonna, look yeah, that. I'll just uh, check it out and then I'll add some images. But thank you very much. I just uh, oh. had lots of fun. I'll go, I'll go back to the drawing board and and spend the rest of the day working on this. I one. know how you work, and it's amazing. <laughs> I feel so inspired by it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Dina. Thank you so much. Um, and I, yeah, I'm just gonna do. I just left this one right here, and I just. It's so amazing when you take a photo and then uh, you're able to analyze it a little bit further. So. I should have mentioned that, but take pictures of the process because they will give you an opportunity to um, almost receive feedback because uh, when the image is very small, um, you're able to find more relationships. So I'm gonna work on this a little bit further. And um, yeah, I'm gonna do another refresh and see if anyone else has um, uploaded any progress, but I will say, uh, I will say that let me see. Hold on one second. This is, I'm so happy with it. Oh, no. Oh, my gosh. This looks amazing. All right. So 
Wow. Okay, Loud, I'm so happy you chose that one. Okay, 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 okay. All right, so I'm gonna go to Lois and uh, oh, this is so beautiful. Oh my gosh, Lois, this is so beautiful. Okay, I we need to do more mushroom paintings, you guys. <laughs> um, this reminds me, is it Ophelia? There's a painting by one of the, all right, I'll let, um, maybe if Sarah, Sarah Jennings is here, uh, she can help me. Um, one of the British, oh, I forgot the name of that school of painting. There's a Ophelia drawing. I mean, I'm sorry, drawing, <laughs> drowning. <laughs> There's a painting of Ophelia drowning in a lake by, uh, I forgot the name, uh, anyhow. Uh, this reminds me of that painting, uh, almost like a close-up of a painting. It's a beautiful painting and it has a lot of um, uh, variations of green. Um, the Okay, sorry guys, um, I'm just going to pause this really on a, a quick second. Uh, I want to find it. Um, Ophelia and uh, John Millet, yes. And they were part of the, come on, how am I just not going to, um, anyhow, I'll, I'll just um, upload it. Ophelia painting, if Chloe, if you're there, you can do this for me, that'd be great. But if not, that's okay. Uh, it just reminds me of that. I love uh, the texture. This is a good example of var variations of texture. Uh, versus uh, blocked out areas. Uh, check the background and also um, the scales on uh, the cap. I'm trying to put uh, things into uh, practice. I see a little bit of the analyst. <laughs> I just wanted to use that word, Lois. And then the vulva, perfect, excellent composition. Uh, I like that there's a little bit off center, but then the cap of the bigger mushroom reaches to the other side. So really nice equilibrium in the imbalance. Beautiful. Um, well done. Gives me enough room to kind of like wander around and observe uh, the mushroom or, or kind of like, um, yeah, observe it from different points of view. So it doesn't feel like um, I don't have enough room to do that. Um, favorite part is the the, the, the shaded area of the bigger mushroom uh, on top of the uh, smaller one. And I think this was an image that I put. Let me just bring the image if I can find it. And uh, oh, yeah, I almost, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so I'm just going to put it right there really quickly. Um, sorry, guys. I know this is teasing, but um, OK, good. Uh, yeah, I just love what you did. Um, oh, it's so good. So OK, I have like a couple of pointers if you wanted to um, work on that. Uh, um, and this reminds me of the texturized background you did with the uh, maskies, with the self-portrait wearing a mask. Um, so I feel like, you know, on the smaller dome, there's almost like rhythm on um, the scales. And I feel like this is a, a little bit more on the flat, um, a little bit flatter. So I would possibly, you did it on the scales on the bigger uh, mushroom. And there's also a sense of the scales protruding uh, above the surface of the cap. And, um, I feel like you could do that also. There's like a cast shadow underneath the scales and a highlight on top, but there's a sense of the scales almost following an organized or har harmonious rhythm. They follow the edge. They have this rounder um, crescent shape. I feel I would possibly uh, organize them somehow in that way. So um, that would be um, an observation if you want to consider it. And then in regards of the, yeah, I love the black. I think that's beautiful. The rest, it looks amazing. The stock looks amazing. Uh, the light direction is great. If you wanted to bring perhaps a little bit more of a cylindric, uh, oh no, you have it. That's fine. Never mind. Don't pay attention to me. And 
um, it's perfect. Yeah, that will be my only thing. But um, it's a beautiful image. It's a it's a gorgeous uh, mushroom painting, if you ask me. So, thanks, Lois. And uh, Alina, oh my gosh, I'm so excited! Thank you so much for sharing your process, and I'm so happy that you joined. I hope you had a good time. This looks amazing. Um, I love uh, the image that you selected. I think. Um, I'm gonna bring it, but I just love that um, combination of darkness in the background, and I love and I love that you chose a painting because I think that's one of the paintings that we use as a as a, an example, and I love that. Um, let me see if I can bring that. Yes, uh, and in fact, that was by a female artist, um, and uh, was it? Uh, who was that? Forgot that. I'll just bring it down. Oh, one second. Here we go. Hold on, one second. So yeah, I love uh, compositionally very well done. Um, I love that you left enough space. I think that's very good. Um, and I like the different visual planes, the things that are more uh, in highlight or highlighted or under the light come forward. Um, I also love the selection of coolness versus warmth. Anything that's warm on a painting uh, always comes forward. So good job uh, pushing uh, the, the, the cool tones on the background. Um, and a few notes that I would say, um, one of my favorite things, apart from the mushrooms, obviously, I just love the rusty um, notes that you brought on the foliage because the foliage, uh, I see that it's almost compartmentalized in the, the different greens. But this one sort of like um, uh, weaves, I think I used the, the, that word, weaves everything together. The fact that you brought this rusty red. So I'm wondering, never mind. No, that's, yeah, never mind. Yeah, no, never mind. Yeah, I was just going to say uh, if you want, if you could have brought something a little bit on other places, but it's not. So I think that's good. I think that's good. So. There's something about the glow of light. It almost feels like the light comes from an opening in the canopies that lits a little bit the trunk of the tree. So I would consider just bringing some light on the trunk because right now it feels uh, really separated from the, uh, the, the light in the scene. It doesn't feel integrated with that. So there's a spotlight on the mushrooms and I would do what I would do consider. I mean, um, again, I'm just trying to bring like a, some notes. Consider um, just bringing a little bit more of a highlight because then what it, what's going to happen is that it's just going to recreate the idea of a spotlight on the mushrooms that slowly fades into the uh, density of the foliage as the as it goes uh, as it goes up the way it happens on the painting. So I would do that, and I would also um, bring more of a. A minty green. Um, if you have, yeah, more of a minty green. I just feel like uh, also uh, to group together the light uh, and, on the, the same circumstances, I would say, in, in that spot, I would just bring some minty green and uh, perhaps adding a tiny bit of yellow to that green because um, this green feels almost like aqua looking. Um, and it's normal because the uh, viridian, viridian green or regular green um, in uh, the tubes, it almost has a little bit too much blue when we use it in botanical subjects. So I would bring some white and a little bit of yellow and try to also create some uh, minty green texture around the mushrooms. Again, with the idea, if you notice, with the idea of bringing this kind of like spotlight. Um, in addition to that, the uh, mushrooms that are like brighter are on the spotlight. So I would just fade slightly um, the mushroom here with a more rusty red and even the scales on top, I would create possibly more of a ecru. So again, bringing the spotlight with three things, um, the bark, the tree bark, a little bit lighter, uh, the minty green, and then just fading perhaps this one a little bit more so it becomes almost outside of the spotlight. I don't have the spotlight, I'm just gonna bring the curtain. But um, anyhow, if you have time, this looks amazing. I just wanted to uh, 
really, really, really thank you for joining. I know that um, it's so challenging because uh, you probably didn't know what to expect. I hope I was helpful and <laughs> specific um, and that you had um, a good time. We would love to see you back if you can. And um, if you do any work on this painting and up upload it on the folder, uh, I'll be able to just give you feedback uh, on any progress. So um, I hope this was okay. Thank you so much, Alina. And I'm just gonna move uh, forward. And uh, Julie, this looks so, so good. Uh, another great um, composition, if you ask me. Um, and that's one of the reasons why when I sent the email, I very specifically said, make sure that you choose different, in, different um, image references. And it's the reason uh, or um, the fact that, you know, uh, all the paintings look super different. So great composition. I love the fact that you left enough space, light direction, uh, very clear from the right to the left. Yes, Dina. Oh, it's, uh, you're muted. Oh, what happened? Uh, am I not? Uh, oh, oh my gosh, you guys. No. Yeah. Hold on one second. Let me see if it's me. Uh, no, no, you can. Uh, I cannot hear you. Can you guys hear me? No. Okay. One second. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah, I cannot hear you guys. All right, let me just kind of like stop this before and see if we can figure. Um... Oh, hmm. Uh... Okay, okay, okay. Ooh, 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 ooh. All right, all right, all right. You guys, I'm so sorry. Um, let me see if I can. Um, hold on, hold on, hold on. Um, okay, I think you can unmute yourselves now. Can you? Yeah. Yes. Hey, oh. Finally. Oh my gosh, you guys, I'm so sorry. We've been hollering at you all yes, day. Yes, we have been. <laughs> That's why we need to. Well, Jane. might have muted us before she left because mm -hmm. I wasn't muted before. Yeah. I know, I, I know. But you guys heard me or no? Yeah, yes, I heard you, but you couldn't oh hear us. Oh my gosh. I'm we so heard you sorry. the whole time. Okay. That's why they were, I was typing you to, that they couldn't hear. And then finally I put on the video. I thought if I could flag you down yeah. and then you could see. <laughs> and I think Chloe was trying to unmute me when uh, Claire was talking. So I, I, uh, I rejected that. The, the, I think it was a mistake. Right. So yeah, yeah. I rejected it because I didn't want to be loud when someone else was talking. Oh, sorry guys. Okay. <laughs> no you can hear you the whole time time so don't worry it was a good lesson in restraint and listening <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh i'm so sorry well speak <laughs> you want to say something? i was gonna say that i could do this assignment over and over again so many times i mean it's i know me too really joyful looking yes i love it good. and there's so It'd many be like a warm -up. yeah Lots more to and do. And then we need to do it all together and then all have a mushroom dinner of some sort. <laughs> <laughs> oh Julie, Julie, up in Ojai, we'll go foraging. Yes, we can forage, although there aren't many out right now. In the winter, we get them. <laughs> but there hasn't been any rain. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. That's right. That's right. The paintings uh, are amazing, guys. Lois, uh, any comments about what I said? I thought you were off the computer when I was talking. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> Yes, I totally agree. I'm I'm on board. Okay. I kind of put those the last ten minutes. Those little okay. dads, but Claire, you nailed those. 
things mm. on top. What are those called? Oh my gosh, amazing. Scales. The, the, the scales. scales. Yeah. Beautiful job. Beautiful, beautiful work. Oh, I'm like so happy about Love this. Love all the brush strokes, amazing. Yeah. They're also, they all such characters, these mushrooms, right? I love the groupings. They look like people, families. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because I was, I was, uh, as I was compiling images of mushrooms, I love the diversity, like some more classical, more modern. And there's always that idea that those examples are quote unquote better because you know there's kind of like more traditional. These paintings are so good, you guys. I don't feel like there is a gap between those supposed examples and what we did. I have to congratulate you because the work looks really amazing. What's so nice is the the different choices mm -hmm. and the color and the color palettes. They're just. Uh, beautiful. I mean, some are small, some, some are groups, some are singular. And the even though this, if they're singular, they're different shapes, they're different colors. Yeah. It's beautiful. Really yeah. nice. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It would be really beautiful. Um, cool. Really. So yeah, amazing. I was just saying that. Um, and thanks, Dina, for just popping up and saying, hey, <laughs> I really appreciate it. So um, yes, I was just saying, I like the composition. Uh, what stands out on the painting, it's not just the way you painted um, the work. It's very Julie. I love your use of black. I think it's excellent. Um, but what stands out on this specific um, uh, painting, it's the way the colors are arranged. So I talked about spatial composition. I talk about detail um, composition. Let's talk about color composition because that's what stands out to me. You know, the fact that you organize the warm tones and they're sort of like uh, organically lining, line, lining up um, on top. And then you have those, the cool light uh, of the light blue below. That contrast and the way it's organized really elevates the painting. And you did something really brilliant, not just um, uh, choosing the subject, obviously. and. Um, the image reference, because again, there's a narrative. Um, there's a narrative in, in everything uh, that we select. But for me, uh, the fact that this is not in nature, that they're on, uh, it looks like a chopping board. So they're ready to be prepared or cooked or, um, uh, you know, tossed in a salad or something like that. So there's a different approach than other paintings. Um, and I love that narrative, you know, again, point of view from above, which is kind of like more modern in that sense. Uh, and the idea of like some someone looking down. So um, the fact that it, it, it inspires or evokes um, someone taking the picture, someone bigger and uh, the tiny uh, mushrooms uh, arranged on the chopping board or a table. Um, but what I wanted to say is that I uh, talked a few times about how important it was to make sure that nothing felt parallel or regular. And the fact that you chose this image not only it doesn't read like that because all the mushrooms have like irregularities and you, you get this sense of like um, dynamic growth, but they are lining up also differently. The caps are at different heights with different sizes and the stems or the stalk is also of different um, lengths. So in addition to make them more organic the way you did the uh, edges, the fact that you brought uh, these irregularities makes it even more dynamic. So it's an incredible painting, Julie. And I don't know how much more I would work on it. If anything, I would just perhaps um, um, wonder or think about um, the spot on, the, on this part of the painting, because I love the gradation from lighter to darker from the right to the left. And I'm just gonna, just leave it up there and see if I can bring the image and see exactly what happens. Well, the it's the I, yeah, so I haven't done anything on the background except the wash and that one <laughs> drip. <laughs> and I, so I'm looking for advice on it. I don't want to put in the hand. You see the hand there? Mm. Um, I'm just not interested in that because I, I look at it as family of mushrooms. We all grow a little differently, you know, um. one kid is tall and one kid is short and mm -hmm. <laughs> one kid is fat and one kid is and so that's why I picked this one but I I just don't know what to do with the tone in the background um okay I don't want to do a chopping block I want to just keep it very neutral so I had thought gray 
um, but I haven't put it on yet. And I do have that warm Portland gray, which kind of reads lavender. I think that might be too strong, but I, I'm just, I don't know. What do you think? Well, I just feel like, you know, be because of, of the fact that they're grouped together and tight, so kind of like touching each other. Um, mm -hmm. I, I would just use like a contrast in the way I would treat the background. So I would just smooth and as desaturated as the bottom. So look at the yeah. bottom right here. It's uh -huh. active, there is warm, but right. it just feels uh, bleached or washed out. And what it does, it enhances the color and the volume of the mushrooms. Okay. So I would just bring that. Sort up. of an ecru. Yeah. Um, can, I, because can I say something about this? Because when I saw it, Julie, this is Claire, and I love that mm -hmm. you put your, your trademark blue in there. But yeah. When I looked at this, maybe because I've been watching too much of The Mandalorian, it looked like a landscape to me. And that thing in the background looks like a cloud. Oh. And they look like they're hanging out in the desert. And I, <laughs> I, would, I would keep it there because it compositionally gives balance. But Interesting. Yeah, that is that interesting. or not, but that's what I saw when I first saw it. Until it was explained to me it was from overhead, I thought they were hanging out, you know, in the desert. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that's, um, that's an interesting point. So uh, what I had is I didn't have such dark shadows on them. Uh, it was more of a neutral shadow because I know I always do my shadows too dark. And then they did not pop out at all because the the tone was a you know a sort of a muddy sand darker brown but then i went to the very deep um the paintings gray for a shadow so uh, now i'm worried about how if they will if that'll still stick out too much does it bother you with the sandy background on the bottom to have I, that I, it's going to be a totally artistic decision you have two paths and i think i would just think about it and see where, which path because its path will take you to a different um mm -hmm. result so uh, ultimately i i think you need to kind of like think a little bit about this and see exactly and you can test also you know it's open space it's not um contained right. so you can always test and then bring back if uh, whatever you have one observation that I would have now that I have the image uh, mm -hmm. next to each other, I love that you darken the shadows, but I feel like you could colorize the mm -hmm. dark values on the caps because they feel very monochromatic. And I feel like if that had color, it would kind of like elevate it. Um, so a darker colored um, yes. brown. Yeah, I added those darks right at the very end, and I which is fine. I mean, it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's but yeah, I, mean, I can lighten that up a bit. I mean, well, just bring it a warmer dark color. Yeah, kind of like a darker uh, color, you know, rather than a shadow. Because uh -huh. I think what you have here is very dramatic, and I love the rhythm of the um, shaded area from slightly dark, uh, lighter to darker because all the stocks feel similar in the way they're treated. It's the shadow that has rhythm and it, that's so, it just dances um, beautifully. I think it's really good. So now I see this more of a neutral note and uh, looking at the image, I feel like that if it were a colored um, darker value, then uh, it would even amplify the dramatic uh, uh, rhythm on the shadows. Okay, right, I think you're right, great. Well, I want to work quite a bit more on it. It's also, it's a bigger canvas. Oh, I love that. 12, what is it? What's up? Uh, nine by 12. And then what's the next one? 12 by 18, maybe. 12 by 16, yeah. 12 by 16. That must be yeah. what it is. Good. So, um, okay, good. Fantastic. Thank you. I have a lot of work to do on it. And I still haven't finished my uh, crow. <clears throat> oh, Oh. <laughs> Whenever I know it's just keeps things keep piling up. <laughs> I know they do. You keep giving us more stuff. It's great. <laughs> Thank you. No, beautiful painting. Thanks. Thanks. And I'm just gonna go to Laura. I just Laura. I, I cannot tell you how much I love that you chose this uh, this composition. I put it because I like strange things, and I thought that was. Uh, a very interesting looking arrangement of mushroom, mushrooms because we don't associate mushrooms with that kind of like image. So I, I love that you chose it because it's just giving you such strong 
uh, original results. You know, it's 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 a it's a group of mushrooms, but then it could be a sculpture or it could be an abstraction of something. So it's not easily recognizable. And I love when things are not easily recognizable. So um, very good job um, uh, selecting that image reference. Well, yeah, last night I didn't go to sleep till like two forty-five in the morning because I, you know, the, I didn't have the the link yet for the, the images. So I, of course I'm, you know, I'm like I want things now. <laughs> so I went. I stayed up looking for images last night. I was like, okay, I'll pick one in the morning, right? In the morning, I stayed. I was gonna walk my dog. I kept looking. I kept looking. And I was like, stop. Let me go see if Julio posted yet, right? So I went. Julio, the first image that came up was that one. I forget about the other ones that I, last night and this morning, I picked like, I don't know, 20. This was so good to me. The colors, uh, from right away, there was the first image that came up. The arrangement, it reminds me of uh, the, what's her name? Yakusama, what's her name? Yeah, yeah, Yakusama. A little bit, but also it's just, I love playing with depth of field. That's why I love that other, I don't know who did it with that beautiful depth of field. Jackie. Uh, yeah shallow depth of field so to me it just exactly what we say something is like coming at me it's a bouquet it's a family all of that it, it just beautiful and the color palette i just i fell in love with it so i hope that i could do it justice <laughs> oh it's, it's already... hard i'm finding it hard yeah but i, it, I like it the challenge. it's already amazing you know what i love also is that um, in, in uh, this kind of like explosion, it's disorienting, and that's a compliment because where is the where's the table? Where's the surface? Is it underneath? Is it on the side? I really don't know where uh, what's grounding this, and and I'm saying this as a compliment. I wouldn't uh, want you to make it specific and make it easy, but there's something really good about this, almost like falling over, and there is this beautiful concentration that creates almost like a vortex of um, this, uh, this discs kind of like flying off in a spiral. Um, I think compositionally it has a lot of movement and a lot of like, um, yeah, tension in a positive way. I use uh, all these terms in a positive way that, you know, so uh, let me just bring it up actually. And then, um, and uh, put it next to uh, what you have and then see if we can just, um, Oh, it's just, yeah, it's really interesting. Okay, yeah, I have like some, um, and I love that it's occupying all the space, by the way, which is something that you could consider as well. But let me just- oh, okay. uh, It's because I, I I thought that I was doing exactly what I always don't do, which is properly um, arrange it as far as space is concerned. But I thought I did, and then I still had to create some um, new mushrooms. <laughs> okay, so, um, as you can see, there's a lot more. There. Right. No, I think it's good. Yeah. I mean, I just like bringing um, this like um, uh, composition. I, I mean, the, the what I love, it's like it's uh, crowding the entire space. But at the same time, I love that you played with space and that you leave um, some uh, completely cropped on the side, but then you leave some open space. So it creates more of an interesting uh, game of, you know, what's crowded, what's empty. So it doesn't feel bad or... Uh, I mean, sorry, bad, like off frame at all. It doesn't feel off frame. It feels very intentional. Uh, the, the, when I first saw it, I didn't feel like it was kind of like off frame or anything strange about composition. But um, yeah, I think I think it's amazing. You have, um, it looks very strong already. Uh, I love the color palette so much. Um, these feel like almost like Oreo cookies or something like really yummy. So it, it has a very candy-like uh, dessert like effect so I would just play with that you know they look like macaroons like half of a macaroon or a macaroon like being pulled away from the other half of the macaroon and being oh, like, yeah. <laughs> having the gooey thing like really expand oh my god that's true <laughs> they also feel like to me like uh like they're wearing a uniform I feel like that's like a made made or d at a I don't know some fancy restaurant or something that's what I <laughs> I feel they're very like very very proper or something. I don't know. I feel like they have, they're wearing a uniform. I love them. It's so cute. Yeah, they're very cute. This button like also I could see yes. that they have uniform and uh, dressing up, you know, it feels like they're like a butt, like a silk button or something. Yes. And Julia, what a wonderful world of the mushroom last night. I was, I was like, wow, wow. Alien, 
a family, everything. Uh, yeah, charming. The one that uh, Lois did was so charming, and all the that. somebody else did blue, uh, blue ones, uh, not blue, um, red. So charming, and the blue. Oh my god, everybody's just so yeah. Beautiful. I think the paintings good. they're really beautiful. Yeah, so I would just continue, and then I would. Uh, there's color wise, um, there's this almost like a uh, deep purple. So yes. I would just bring those purple notes if you want um, yes. on on this uh, caps that are super interesting. And at the same time, I feel like there's a lot of pink or or yeah. So I would just bring like uh, this purple and pink could really um, bring the, the the painting like forward. Uh, the same way, I mean, I know that that was one of a kind and we're not going to look back at it, but your teacup painting with the uh, hibiscus flower was nuts. <laughs> <laughs> what, you brought so many textures and you brought so many colors and um, it, it's, it was, it's such an intricate painting. I mean, that was that and we're not going to compare anything to that. But at the same time, I just love the way that you brought so much uh, detail color-wise in different parts of the painting. So if you had the time, I would definitely entertain the idea of bringing more of the purple and then, uh, which you did, some of the pink also. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the, the purple. I did not see the pink. I thought it was more of an amber, but I love, <clears throat> it was more of an amber, but I love the idea of the pink. I think it, it yeah. Yeah, I mean it's a it's a very nude tone, maybe not pink, but uh yeah. maybe have sort of like nude. But yeah, gorgeous. Can't wait. Gorgeous, gorgeous, Laura. Okay, okay, good. I was like, oh, I'm way behind, but that's okay. No, 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 no. Please work on it and then yeah, your crow. Are you gonna work on your crow maybe or yes, it's been staring at me for two days. <laughs> uh I like I've been attempting and then somebody else needs a favor. I'm like, oh that's it, my light's over, and then I I, I because it's so dark, my lighting here oh. is not good at night. So yeah. Okay. Time. No pressure, but yeah, that's such an interesting uh, painting. So good job. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. And actually I took more pictures of more crows because I walk Lola every day at the park there. And I actually want to do another one. So <laughs> but you know, my life changed with the crow paintings. Now it's see them totally different. And again, Julio, they are actually um, in trend. Some, I just saw something. I will send oh, really? it to you. Yes, I saw something. Oh, oh, the stamp, the forever stamp is the first time they, they, they pick an indigenous and it's a raven. No. It, 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 they just unveiled it yesterday. And it's oh, so... that American flag? That's so fantastic. No, it's not an American flag. It's a, a raven. Oh, no, I mean, they used to, the forever stamp used to be just an American flag. So that's such an improvement. Oh, yeah, 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 that's right. Yes, I, they have uh, um, astronauts, uh, you know, all these artists. Um, and they yes. just came up with it like recently, like yesterday? Yesterday, <laughs> yesterday they unveiled it. It's like this very kind of graphic -y, but it's uh, the image of a raven and it's very uh, indigenous. It's All right, you guys, if you're by the computer, do it for me. If you can find it, upload that image. I want you guys to be my helpers uh, today. So, somebody, Kusami, please. Find it, upload it, and put the link because I think that is such a great connection. How I love how these things happen so serendipitously. You know, like we do something and then we think, like, and then all of a sudden someone, um, is launching something related to it. I love when these things happen makes me feel more like a mushroom connected to someone else. And it's the first time that it's an indigenous scene. No way. Yes, so it's a big deal. Yeah. I, I, oh my I God, I should have sent it to you. I don't know why. I, it's I a combination know. of a big deal and pretty sad at the same time. Yes. <laughs> yes. And, and then to add to that, amazing that you're always on trend. <laughs> oh, well, you know, I think it's that, I don't know if we are on trend because sometimes it's us picking up that energy. It's not just us mm -hmm. radiating the oh, energy. Wow. Yeah, well, so. Whatever it is you're connected to, Julio, <laughs> it's like it's working for all of us. <laughs> oh, no way. That's it? Nobody can find it? Oh, well, you know, I'm just going to. Uh... I just put it in the chat. OK. Awesome. Thank you, Claire. I just want to go to this freaking awesome uh, mushroom cave of glowing the dark mushrooms that it just looks like really 
Wow. Insane. Wow. Um, that's just beautiful. I, I didn't wow. anticipate like that. Um, it would look like that. I thought it would be on the ground, but uh, it makes it even more interesting. Wow. That it reflects in the water. Um, and what? I mean, human nature is so incredible. It's, I know, it's, it's crazy. Incredible. How research into glowing fungi could lead us, could lead to trees lighting our streets. Can you imagine? Mm. I would mm. want to live in that city. That would be pretty amazing. Uh, instead of all this like EMF uh, radiation crap that we're getting exposed <laughs> to. Right. But, I have uh, to say that there's an amazing film too, that fantastic fungi film. It's on, um, I put it on the chat yesterday. Okay. Uh, it does cost $4.99, but it's an incredible, it's about an hour and it just mm -hmm. goes through so many things and the visuals are stunning because they do a lot of a slow, um, the capture, the, uh, what do you call that? Time lapse capturing mm -hmm. of mushrooms growing, but they also talk about all the benefits and all the strangeness and all the psychotic effects. And it's just the most incredible film. And it's just out recently. So watch it if Ooh. you can. Okay. <laughs> really great. I'll, thanks, Julie. I noticed that you mentioned it yesterday, but yeah, I'll just uh, make a note and then I'll watch it because I like to go deep with uh, our subjects. Uh, and that's going to give me a reason to just watch the documentary. Yeah. What is it called again, Julie? Fantastic Fungi. So and it, it talks all, a lot about how it can help save our, our environmental problems, too. Is that, that on Netflix? Um, I think it's Amazon Prime and you have to pay for it still. Okay. Like four bucks or three ninety nine or four ninety nine, something like that. But it, uh, I think it's partly produced by a producer up here in Ojai. So that was how oh, I got wow. onto it really worthwhile i think these um these uh, iridescent mushrooms are just incredible mm, just <laughs> amazing. Super nice. about that blue mushroom i know i didn't even, even click on the link because you know I, I mean i'm pretty sure that it just leads to some sort of like pigment or something i just uh so i put another blackbird stamp in the chat i don't know if it's a real stamp it was on etsy based on the Andrew Wyeth painting, but then there's also the indigenous Alaskan Black Raven stamp. They're both in the chat. I can just find a chat window. I don't know where this is. And oh, the first one, your first link. Oh, that's okay. cool. Mm. Right, I love that. The Tlingit artist design. I think that's the one. Yeah, Raven and, uh, stamp by Rico Worrell. Beautiful. And then um, it goes on to describe what Raven means. I'm just you know, gonna, I'm opening it, but um, yeah, I'll just put it on the folder also. Um, do you see it? I, do I, I, uh, I downloaded a uh, screenshot of my computer. It's bad, okay. bad quality, but at least it's there. Yeah, I'm using a different browser, so that's why I cannot open it on this one. Uh, but I'll upload it on the folder. Um, and don't feel bad about Laura going to bed late because I was, uh, trying to shop for mushroom sweaters at 1 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> Did you find any, Julio? Because now I want. I just, I did it because uh, um, there were some hoodies on Amazon for 30 bucks, but you know, they were, they were cheap looking and kind of like printed. Yeah. And I wanted sort of like a knitted one. Uh, and it was like 600 bucks. No, forget Oh my gosh. <laughs> so I was like, crazy. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I just couldn't find anything needed for. The, these images will, will be wonderful on on um, a t-shirt or. A, oh yeah, uh, you, yeah, yeah. Not these, Yeah, let me see if I can see the stamp once. once you no, know, Laura, it's so funny. When I saw the photo of the one that I did, I was really surprised no one had taken it already because I was like, "That's it. That's <laughs> the, one the one." You're giving that away, right? As a gift or something? I'm get, yeah, I'm gonna paint them for my sisters for Christmas. That's beautiful, Claire. There I want to do Claire? more of a show. Claire, I, is that oh my gosh, that's a, is that like a real stand? The other one from Etsy? I don't know. I just I it says Well, yeah, we can't see it. Oh, uh, let me see if I can. I, I have. I'm it gonna says, switch. Uh, it's on Etsy, and it says it's a ten blackbird forever postage stamps. It's an Andrew Wyeth painting, mm. and you can use them for mailing. But I don't. They're from Ada Weiss Post. Mm. 
Uh, this is the, I just switched my. Uh, but I, I think you can use them for stamps. Yeah. This, I would love a t-shirt of this. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah. is the Andrew Wyatt um, wow. stamp. It's a painting. Uh, I didn't know that he had a painting of. Yeah. It's not beautiful. Mm. Yeah. Of, uh, are they ravens? Well, it says blackbird, but the way you can tell a difference between a raven and a crow is the tail. One is a curved and one is straight across. Hmm. Interesting. So cool. Yeah, I'll find out. Not a oh. I think it's beautiful. Thanks for checking uh, and beautiful. putting the reference. I, I Google. <laughs> no, cool. And this is the forever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 2021. Hmm. That's just beautiful. beautiful. I love this uh, oh. more graphic um, raven stamp. Wow. Okay, I'll share it, Laura. Thanks for sharing. It's that. very indigenous, isn't it? Isn't yeah. The way they, yeah. With their, uh, the way they, um, the way they, uh, yes, yeah. exactly. I'll upload it and share it uh, also. And um, and apparently it means something with like what what it has in its seek, like the world or something. I forget. Mm -hmm. I read it very late at night. Cool. Wow. I have to go. Thank you, guys. That yeah, thank fun. you. We'll be in touch. Thanks, Bye, Julie. Julie. Bye, Thanks. Julie. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you Bye. so much. Bye. Thanks, Julie. Bye. Um, Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. This was amazing. Um, and oh, you guys, I think if you want to, uh, I'm going to do something that I'm not allowed to, but I'm going to share uh, Jen's uh, video. Uh, can you guys? Uh, oh. She just sent video a video for what, Hulu? So she was in her trailer and she, oh. she looked so cute. I have to share with you guys. And I'm going to dump it on the folder. Uh, give me a second. And then I'm going to take it out of the folder because, you know, but you guys need to see this because it's super cute. Hold on one second. It's uploading. Uh, hold on one second. Uh, so you can all watch it. And uh, she was so excited and she looked so good. And they gave her a trailer. Um, and she just took a video of the trailer. She was saying that the next trailer, Brad Pitt was getting ready for his show. Apparently he's doing a show. And then, uh, so it was, uh, it was really cute to see her. Um, well, she was sharing the lot with the... Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know exactly what it was, but let me just share the image. And then I think, oh, thanks, uh, Laura, for uploading the snapshot. <laughs> And let me see if the video is up. Um, hold on one second. Oh, here, here it is. Okay. Oh, she's so beautiful. Oh, yeah. How cute. Oh, how cute. Wait, wait. It's floating. I think it's going to play. I've never done this. Before. Hi, everybody, she said. We can't hear it, but. Oh my God, look at her 80s oh outfit. <laughs> oh, I didn't even think it was 80s. I didn't even realize. Yeah, the Goldbergs is set in the 80s. Oh, she's doing the Goldbergs. I didn't know yeah. that. Okay. Oh my God, that's awesome. Oh, huge. <laughs> that's great. That's sweet. What do you want? Oh, wow, can't wait to see it. <laughs> That's cute. <laughs> Superstar. <laughs> We don't need to hear it. We know how cute she is. Oh, adorable. <laughs> you can't hear, but yeah. It's okay. Oh, there it is. <laughs> uh, you have the video 
Can you have the video. Um, you can play it on uh, on your oh, end. Okay. Yeah. And really quickly, um, also, um, sorry, Sarah Jennings, I just got it and I uploaded it. And you guys don't have to stay if you need to go, but I just wanted to make sure that I included uh, her painting before leaving. And um, and let me see if I can see it. Yeah, here we go. So thank you, Sarah, uh, for uploading. Oh, oh, nice. wow. It's really beautiful. And I love the darkness and um, also the variations, nice color combination. Uh, great color palette um, and I'm gonna bring the image really quickly I because um, let me see um, I have one uh, uh, comment uh, in regards oh yeah here we go I know it's um, hold on a second I'll just do this really oh wow I love how she did her own thing um, let me see if I can okay here we go all right so um Again, I think um, compositionally, I'm just gonna look at the composition first, but it's uh, uh, very getting really close to the left side and that just pulls the, it just pulls the um, composition uh, towards the edge. Um, just bringing it up and um, so it's okay. I think it's okay, but um, you leave less room on that side in order to uh, have space to go around uh, the crowding of almost the canopies of those trees. Um, and I love that you brought uh, a uniform black. I think that's a very good idea. I think I would just, uh, I, I, I would bring some more like a uh, reddish or almost orange notes uh, on top because uh, I feel like that's gonna uh, distinguish them from the, uh, from the, stem i forgot the word uh, yeah from the stem because uh, i feel like it's very similar in that sense so i would bring a little bit more of that uh, golden toasty um element on top uh, i love the blues i think that's beautiful and I, I just i know that you have this really challenging connection of the gills with the uh with the stem and um yeah, I would possibly just create a little bit more distinction between the rim or the edge of the uh, cap and the gills. Because right now it almost feels like it just picks up a little bit, except for this one. This is a good example of what I would do. But um, on this one, I know that there's a lot of paint and it's very wet, but it would bring more of a distinction um, between the edge and uh, the gills. Um, and I like the variations on the uh, stem, I think that's really good. Um, yeah, I think that's what I would do. Yeah, I think that's what I would do. Um, I feel like there's a lot of regularity on the domes. So uh, I know that there is a lot of regularity, but this one, for example, it's matched. So it feels pr pretty flat. So I feel like they're all a little bit too similar in regards of uh, the regular edge on top on the dome. It is very regular. It is very regular, but there are a couple like this one is not only this one smashed, but it kind of like pushes the other dome down a little bit. So mm -hmm. I feel like I would just, at least with a couple, I would just um, mold and squish a little bit the dome so they don't feel all uh, similar in that sense. Um, yeah, I think those are the notes that I would just uh, mention. And sorry that I didn't, I just got the text message later and then um, I'm glad you um, sent me a note. Okay, thank you, I'll work on it. Thank you, thank you so much for uh, painting it. It's just it's amazing, it's a great addition to, um, yeah, to the rest of the collection. All right, well, thanks so much, you guys. This was uh, so much fun, I really appreciate it. And um, thank you again for an amazing uh, time and uh, I enjoyed the subject so much more than I thought I would. I'm so happy that you guys also had fun. We had a really big group today, so uh, it just makes me happy. I have no idea what we're gonna do on Friday, uh, next Friday, I, just, I, I don't know, but this was really fun. Yeah, it was. Really fun, Julio, and, and you handled it beautifully without Jen there. Of course, we love Jen, but Chloe was great. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I see Chloe. Yeah, oh. yeah, no, it's, Chloe. 
it, it shows. I'm, I'm surprised she had time to paint in, in addition. <laughs> All right. I know. Oh, I know. She's like no. superwoman. She was, um, Jen hoped that, because she was there at uh, 6 a.m. and she hoped that she would be done by uh, 11 so she could join the session with us. And she was really bummed that she wasn't joining. So, you know, um, uh, anyhow, so yeah, it's it just shows you how uh, good it is when someone partners up with you and then just feeds information and stuff. And not to mention all the things that come up like the noise and stuff like that, you know, and thank you guys, but it just shows you how important it is to have a co-host uh, in one of those sessions. It's really valuable. When you have one, you really appreciate um, <laughs> when you split responsibilities and take care of issues and stuff, so. And then you just think about the, uh, the painting aspect of it. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. Thank you, Julio. Oh, thank you thank so you. much. Yeah, have, have, have lunch. Stay you safe, guys. please. Bye, everyone. It's crazy what's going on out there? Bye. Yeah. Bye. 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 Bye.